So in this particular presentation, we're going to have about four or five different different ways of looking at things. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is talk about what we are. I'm going to ask a question first of you, of you, you few people here. Okay. So in terms of what we are, what are we? Anybody care to enlighten me, <laughs> giving you the, the knowledge of your level of understanding of what we are? Co-creators, okay. Well, essentially, spiritual being having a third-dimensional density experience. Excellent. Essentially, a spiritual being. Define a spiritual being. And I was going to say angelic. Uh, well, we could say angelic. That's a good question. Define <laughs> spiritual being. Define spiritual uh, being. Yeah. One that is an entity unto itself but having originated as an entity from the source. Okay. Source of okay. In other words, it's an individualized essence of source. Okay. That's reasonable. Okay. I want to go even further than that. Okay. We're pure sentience. Okay. We are individualized source sentience. This is reasonably new news. Now is this just as a human being or is this in This is in all cases. This is in all cases. Yeah? We are we are we are levels of sentience. So if you think about those entities that incarnate as human beings or other incarnate vehicles around in and around the physical universe, because the human being isn't just the only incarnate vehicle that's used, there's many others. As we know, we know that animals are incarnate vehicles for a different level of sentience, okay? And there's a level of sentience in between the animal and what we know as incarnate mankind, which has only started to be able to be allowed to incarnate into the human vehicle and, be, and, allowed, and therefore being allowed to have individualized free will. And they're the, the backfill people. And individualized self-awareness? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Could you talk more about sentience, or you're going to? Yeah. See, sentience, see, sentience, from our perspective, sentience, let's, let's keep it at the human level. Well, not the human level, but in terms of where, what we are. As pure sentience, we're individualized. That's an English spelling, by the way. <laughs> individualized from source. Individualized from source. Ooh, right? So we are a chunk, a piece of sentience. It's individualized from source. But we're energy beings, aren't we? Yeah. Even with the physical form, this is energy. So what we are is we're, in, we're, we're sentience given a body of energy. Sentience given a body of energy. Okay? We'll see. Now then, what do I mean by a body of energy? Solidified. Nope. Form. Nope. The body of energy is not the human form, it's the energy that the sentience occupies. Because not only are we a, an, a, an entity of pure sentience, individualized source, en, en, source <coughs> sentience, or source entity sentience, we have been given a body of energy to work with. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna delve right into this in some, in some real depth. Now that body of energy is what we work with. And then we move, we move around the multiversal structure in that body of energy. And then part of that body of energy incarnates into the human form. Okay, so there's, 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 a, a, whole, there's a whole structure of what we do here. I mean, this is gonna take some time actually. So as a, as a piece of individualized source entity sentience, a unit of source entity sentience given a body of energy, or with a body of energy that we've commandeered, that's another angle, okay? We are both sentience and energy. 
Okay? It's only when we get to a certain level do we, are we able to move around that body of energy or move out of that body of energy and commandeer other energy. I'm going to go into this in some detail. So what we are, we're pure sentience basically. Okay? And depending upon our ability, we either use the body of energy that we, that we were given by source or we move outside of it and we, we can use other bodies of energy or we can create a body of energy. Okay. So that's what we are in general. Okay. Now then, this is an interesting bit as well because fortunately for us, we are entities that are created and to a certain level educated upon creation. So we haven't had to go through the sort of same process that we go as a as a human infant where we know nothing and then we're educated as a, as a result of our lifetime. So we were sentient and knowledgeable at the same time. So we understood what we were. We were self-aware. We were conscious sentience. In actual fact, to get to the level of sentience, if we were allowed as energy, remove the sentient bit, if we were, if we were a portion of energy, an energy can become sentient in its own right, given enough time, we would go through a series of phases. And there's around 20 different phases that, it, that, that the energy goes through to get to the level of sentience. But I'm going to give you very, a very truncated version of that. Okay? Energies, any energy within source, can, given long enough and enough mass, gain its own level of rudimentary intelligence. Okay? We know that as human beings because we've seen it in cellular structures, we've seen it in bacteria, okay? we've seen it in viruses. Limited intelligence means it understands it needs to get together with other, other functions of that same type of energy. Okay? So it groups together. Eventually you get a group of energies big enough to create a bigger, bigger level of intelligence. That bigger level of intelligence creates another function, a, a quantum leap in evolution. And that evolutionary status gives us a level of self-awareness. Awareness of self. The intelligence goes from being simply intelligent, by that we mean making logical decisions that are probably not understood, but there's a choice between going here or going there, joining with that energy rather than that energy, doing this because it, it creates a level of either progression by growing the, the energy together, or it creates a level of enjoyment, so we keep doing something. There's computer programs that have got this, by the way. Rudimentary intelligence computer programs that go around and seek other computer programs because they enjoy the company of those computer programs. Okay? They've been around for a long time, actually. A disturbingly long time, actually. Is this how soul families are formed? I want to come into this in a moment. Okay. This, is, this, is, this is really up there right now. Yeah. Soul families are right down there. So I've got, to, I've got to go right from the top to come down. Okay? Yeah. So we, we, in terms of being self-aware, the intelligent energy becomes self-aware and knows what it wants to do to a certain level. It makes decisions. Okay? Like animals, animals group together because they like to be in a pack or group. They like to interface with human beings. They like to feed. They like to feel, feel full. They like to go out into the sunshine and bask in the sunshine. Well, certainly cats do anyway. Okay? <laughs> and lizards do as well. <laughs> okay. They start to do things based upon a, 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 an advanced form of intelligence, this self-awareness. They know what they are and they know what they like to do. And they know that they have to do certain things to perpetuate their existence. Mm -hmm. There's also a desire to move to club together with other levels of energies. Okay? And eventually it gets to the point where that energy is big enough to create something else. Consciousness. Conscious self-awareness is something completely different from pure self-awareness, which is something completely different from intelligence. Intelligence is just a, a basic fundamental function. Do these stages that you're outlining reflect how the source began to discover itself or how the origin did? How the origin, how the origin did. These, these twi I think it's 22 different stages is how, the, is how the origin became yeah. self-aware yeah. Okay, yeah. because the sources were created pretty much 
fully loaded, but were given the opportunity to become sentient in their well, own right in their so own time. The origin developed it first and then created the source entity. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just getting the feeling as you're talking about this that we're in reverse mode now as we are ascending. In other words, we're down here now. We're just building this back up, the self-awareness, the consciousness, right? Could you... Uh, in, in a, I'll come to that in a moment oh, because okay. actually, actually, what you're talking about is an intelligent motor car. Not what we are. We are not the human form. Okay? We are not the human form. We are beyond the human form. Okay? This, is, this, is, this is the thing we have to get out, get out of. Get out of this bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So when we've got enough conscious self-aware energies that group together and become larger and larger and larger, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, it starts to be able to potentially create things. And at the point it starts to create things, it becomes another level of evolution, sentience. And it starts to be able to create things to help itself evolve and help other parts of itself evolve as well, or other, other intelligent, self-aware, conscious, sentient energies. Okay? So that could be the Elohim? Mm, well, the Elohim are, are the source entities in my understanding. Okay. The Elohim aren't the ascended masters. They are not ascended masters. There's something up there. It's mankind's misunderstanding again. They, they, mankind always likes to attribute things in terms of mankind, in terms of humankind, because we're stuck in our heads. We're stuck in our heads. So the Elohim, the co-creators, are the source entities. We're also co-creators, but a level lower. And the level lower is where the ascended masters come from. Oh. Okay. 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 <laughs> so when you get to this 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 point. When we get to this point where the energies are so big that they become sentient, eventually that sentience starts to understand that it can move around the energies that it works with. And it can move around and manipulate the energies and make the energies that it's part of do different things, metamorphoses into different things. And then eventually it gets to the point where it realizes actually the sentience itself because it can move around this body of energies that it's been given, or in the stage of this evolutionary profile I'm telling you now, start to realize that it can exist outside of those energies. That it's not particularly linked to the energies that it finds itself within. So it can go without. Okay? And that's where we are. We are pure sentience, initially given a body of energy by the source, because we were created. Okay? We've been created. We haven't naturally evolved in the process that I've very loosely described in the way that the origin evolved. That's the detail behind that's in the next book. It's, it's to do with we were perfectly created in this instance. So we came in as a sentient being with a body of energy. Some of us have recognized that our sentience is not specifically aligned to that body of energies or needs to be specifically aligned to that body of energies or any other body of energies. And so they can move around. They can move out of that body of energies and collect and form another body of energies. They can commandeer energies. And so we can move around and, re and create a new body of energies. Okay. The human body is not one of those body of energies. Is it a conscious energy? No. No, 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 it can be anything. Actually, it can be energies that are already going down the road of being intelligent or being sort of self-aware. And they can be pulled in and then manipulated to become useful to that, that piece of sentience. Okay. Because I wonder if it can be done without that energy and obviously without the permission of that energy that they're incorporating. How do you mean? Meaning that they can just go out and collect without that uh, consciousness of being saying, oh, yeah. I don't yeah. want to join. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, as a sentient being, you would be able to just change the function of that energy. Yeah. So if that energy was self-aware, but it hadn't got to the point where it was able to control its own environment, because it hadn't become conscious, because yeah. self-awareness and consciousness is different things. Self-awareness is like a bird looking into a mirror. 
and noticing that if he moves out of the mirror, this other bird comes along. That's awareness. That's, yeah? That's only a little leap above intelligence. And intelligence is a big subject. You know, this is why does it is long. Okay? So we, we can take energies that are not progressing or have progressed to various different levels. Okay? Or we can use energies that have been used by other sentient beings that are already there. Rather like your motor car and your used car sale lot. <laughs> been, used by, been used by somebody else. So in terms of what we are, we're a, we, we are a fully functional, individualized unit of pure source entity sentience that has been given or has moved away from a body of energies and has created their own body of energies. Now then. That leads us to understand what we are energetically. Because if we think of ourselves as this body of energies, let's think of ourselves as a, a sphere. Okay? That's the true energetic self. Depending upon your knowledge base, it's either the Godhead, the Oversoul, or the Higher Self. So this would be a unit of pure sentience with a, a body of energies that's being used. Okay? To allow us to evolve, we do certain things, different things. One of those different things is that we project part of ourselves into a physical vehicle. To experience this level of the multiverse, this low frequential level of the multiverse, in the way it needs to be experienced. Experiencing resistance, decrepitude, <laughs> you know, intelligence, limitations, lack of communication with the rest of the true energetic self. Okay? So this goes into the, the human being. Okay? Or another animal that is of the same level of quality within the rest of the physical universe. That means another potential vehicle that is capable of housing an aspect, sometimes called the soul, in old speak, of our higher self. Okay? So this could be, for instance, a Pleiadian, a human, a lizard, yeah? anything else that is capable of holding a, a, a chunk of sentience, okay? an aspect of sentience there. So any of, these in, in, any of these alien bodies or other galactic bodies, they're just the same as human beings. They're a, a vehicle that we use to experience that particular environment that they come from. That planet in that galaxy, or that part of the galaxy, or some other part of a galaxy within the physical universe. Not specifically on this frequency level either. They can be at other frequency levels, above the third frequency level, which is where we are now. It could be the fourth frequency level, fifth, sixth, seventh, up to the twelfth. Which means that we won't see them with our physical eyes, we won't touch them with our hands, because they're a level of frequency well above the highest radio wave frequency that we use. Okay. So all of the, a lot of the entities that are surrounding the Earth now are invisible to us because we can't detect them. <laughs> They're a higher frequency, but they're nevertheless physical. Right. So, the true energetic self has the capacity to project Oops. 12 souls into 12 different bodies at any one time anywhere okay these any number of these are called a soul group because they come from the same over soul true energetic self higher self or godhead okay so those two together will be soulmates. So the chances and the chances of you incarnating with your soulmate 
is almost non-existent. Yeah, both location-wise and temporally, because they're doing different things. They don't all come out at the same time. Yeah, you, you may have true selves that may have two aspects or souls projected into physical bodies. They may have four or six or nine. It's not specifically often they would do all 12. Well, that's some do because they're coming and going. Yeah? The different timelines, the different vehicles that are being used have different longevity. So although you might put them all out at the same time, one body might die in 30 years, one might die in 3,000 years, one might die in 300 years. Yeah? That's something else. Karma, we discussed on, we just, yeah. Oh no, karma, yeah. karma is how, how we refer to ourselves and the environment we're in here and how attracted and addicted we get to any, anything, any function, whether it's material function, thought-based function, behavior-based function, status-based function, or, or anything else that's, that's out there. It's how we, associate ourselves with being here if we think we if we believe in any of those different ways or work in different ways that we are here we're human beings then that's that's karma that pulls us down that stops us from moving out of our bodies and our consciousness going elsewhere okay. that's that's something completely different now then so there's potentially 12 of these okay and any two or any three together or any four are soulmates. They're all soulmates because they all come from the same true entity self. There's lots of these. <laughs> There's billions of these things, okay? This is the this is the individualized unit of sentience with a given body of energy. So it's the ultimate individuality? Yes. That is there, yes. 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 Now then, what can happen is that each of these can create Another 12 projections out called shards. Okay, so these shards, they're a shard. Okay. Almost, we have the expression, if you break the glass, there's a shard. Yeah, they're a shard. shard. There we go, a shard. Yeah. They are smaller units. They're a sort of a function of sub soul, if you want to call it that. And the aspect of the soul can project again up to 12. So if, if every aspect was projected down from the Trinitic self and every aspect projected 12 shards out together, there would be 144 potential existences experienced by the Trinitic self at the same time concurrently. This doesn't take account of event space, parallel conditions. Because any parallel condition, any duality created by one of these, or one of these, where there's a choice to make and therefore a new localised space or parallel universe is created, although it's, that it's not specifically experienced by the aspect in its, in its multiple parallel conditions, the true self does experience it all in one go. So although there's potentially a maximum of 144 different incarnations that can happen, if you added all up the potential event spaces or localized universes or parallel universes that these things can create through having a choice of doing this or this, this could be experiencing well over a million different conditions of existence concurrently or more. So that's where parallel lives come in. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, an aspect can project any of these before incarnation, during incarnation, or after incarnation. Yeah. Why the number 12? Number 12 is a result of the structure of the origin. Everything in the origin is in twelfths. <coughs> and, and why is that? Did the origin have a choice? Have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> it, 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 it didn't have a choice. It was part of what it discovered about itself. That everything, everything was in twelfths. The Archangel Gabriel said, the creator's rather attached to the number 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it would be because it, it's, it's part of its structure. And attached to yeah. it. Now, in the, in the book The Origin Speaks, I, I'm given the structure, current understanding of the structure of the area of polyomniscient, sentient self-awareness, that is the origin, in its current level of understanding of self. And there's 12 levels of those. So we go, think, we go from things like frequency to subdimensional components to full dimensions to zones to continuums to event spaces to spectra there's all sorts of different things going not spectra in terms of light but it's it's there's all sorts of other different things that are up there it's big and everything everything is contained within one of those twelfths so everything is like duplicated so it's so it's twelve times a set of frequencies times it's, and it's like it's, it's everything is Everything is multiplied by the power of 12 every time it expands into one of these different parts of itself. Wow. So, it's, like so it's 12, <laughs> so it's always, it's always the product of 12 to the power of 12, 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 to the power of 12. Power of 12. <laughs> so you can see how big the origin is. You know, you get, uh, and Europe still wants stones to not only Yeah, yeah. 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 While you're on the origin, it is only talking, it's, it's only discovered, like you were once telling me, the smallest. A fraction, a fraction of only a, a tenth. Only a fraction of itself. Yeah, it's only a fraction of, it hasn't even, it hasn't even got to a tenth of one percent of itself yet. Oh my God. In yeah. all of this, it hasn't even gotten to a tenth of one percent. Well, no wonder it goes on yeah. forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No wonder no one really knows the entire truth. Yeah. <laughs> now then, these subsouls. Or, or shards, these also can be classified as soulmates as well, because they're a function of a, a, lower, a lower godhead, if you want to call it that, a smaller godhead, which is the aspect. Okay. Almost like fractals. Almost like fractals, but not in this instance, because this is st a static function. Fractalized is based upon the event space when it starts to you get a choice there, you get a choice there, then there's another two choices there, there's another three or four choices there. It's like a, the event space grows in a fractal ray, rather like, well, a holographic fractal ray, way, rather like the way you see a tree, tree branches. Go it comes out that way. Right. Now there's various different types of way in which we do incarnate, but I'm going to go into the, 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 the general way we incarnate later, but there's a, there's a number of things that come out of this. Okay. If there was another TES over here, and it got its own aspects. Yeah. 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 And one of those was used to working with one of those, they'd recognize each other on a fundamentally energetic level or sentient personal level, personality level. You would feel, potentially, that you are soulmates, but you're not. That's a sympathetic soul, it's because you've worked together before, because the true energetic cells work together with each other to do, experience different things, and they club together and work together. So these two together, if they incarnated together, and they worked together in some way, not necessarily in a romantic relationship, but maybe in some other way, would work together really well, and they would be called sympathetic souls. Okay? It's possible that it's just uh, three souls can incarnate in one body, or more than three souls. And this is why we get things like um, psychotic problems or bipolar problems because there's not one soul in the body and there hasn't been a formal agreement as to who's the boss <laughs> who's 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 the primary who's the primary the primary aspect in the body and we call it insanity right you call it insanity if you want to yeah or you can call it uh, what do they call it 
Um, there's, there's a psychosis or something they call it, I can't remember the name now, but schizophrenia, schizophrenia that's the one. Well, a multiple personality disorder would fit. Yeah, 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 that's all that, yeah. Schizophrenia is a function of that. Basically what happens is, you, there, there, is, there are a lot of individuals who do have more than one aspect in their, their physical form. But one of them is the primary soul. And therefore that primary soul animates the body. That's primary. The other two, or more, are passive. So they're experiencing what's been happening with the physical form and all the interactions with the, within, within the, the incarnation that that body's having and how that particular soul is driving that body, but they're not able to affect the environment that the body finds itself in. So they're like backseat drivers in your car. They're the backseat passengers. They're sitting in the, in the back. They could, should that particular soul wish to move out, take control. Do they cooperate with the primary soul? Only in so much as they exist within the same energy set and experience the same things. They would communicate clearly, but in terms of the, the motivation or the driving force of the body, they would stay in a passive mode. They stay in the back seat. This, this one's the driver. See, we hear of Obama being maybe two or three souls, maybe more. Yeah. That's so, the so, 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 the, yeah. so there will be aspects or even shards that are in that particular body that have had experience in previous incarnations <coughs> relative to this skill set that's required to make this particular body capable of taking on board the responsibilities that ne that's necessary in its incarnation. Yeah. There was one statement that Obama had 10,000 lives in preparation for this incarnation. At, to pre but maybe that combines all the experience yeah. of the yeah, universe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So basically, if that had 330 lives, that had 330 lives, that had 330 lives, that's close to... You're going to guess, yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. You so much. yeah. As, a, as an example. Now then, if we have a problem here and we do get this issue of, not, of one of them not being the dominant one and you've got the rotation of personalities and that person, that, that person starts to have schizophrenic conditions where that one person that is there one day and the next person that is there another day and they're completely different types of personality. That can be cured. I was going to ask, is there a healing? There is. And interestingly enough, the lady who is my agent in India had a, a client who had that problem. She said, I've been working with this client for two years. She's a young lady, about 20, 23 or something. And her family are really, really concerned. And she said, I've not, I've not had any luck at all with using the, the hypnosis that she was using, the quantum healing hy hypnosis. She said, can you tell me what's going on? And I logged into this lady and I found out she got three souls in place and not one of them had got the, uh, the primary role. They were all, you know, basically in, 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 in a, in a, in a, in a passive but controlling role. Not, neither, none of them had been able to assume which one, was what, which one was correct. So I said, initially, what you need to do is to, under therapy, communicate with one of those. When, when one of those is dominant, in its dominant phase, you need, to con you need to tell that what's going on so it understands. And then you have to have another session when another one's in a dominant phase and do the same thing with that one. And then another session when the other one's in, in a dominant phase and again explain it. But that could take three sessions of about an hour or more. And I did some further meditation on it. And I said, why don't you use your quantum healing technique, go right down to the soul level and have the, all three present at the same time and explain what's going on and explain that the body can't cope with it. And then when you establish which one is the, which, which of the personalities is the preferred personality by the family, then you assign that as the primary soul, or primary aspect, and the others can be passive. And she did that, I believe, and it solved the problem. 
Yeah, yeah, they listen. Yeah, they listen because they don't want the, the this to fail. They don't want this to be inefficient in its ability to experience existence here. They want it to work. So when the, once they understand, once they understood that the two of them have got to be passive and one can be the primary, and they agree, it's it's, it's sorted, and the, and the psychosis goes away. Is this the same thing that happens with the the gifted characters with like Aspergers and things like that, who are so intelligent that they don't have no? Uh -uh. That's something different. That's basically when a child is born with an, as with an aspect and that, that aspect is allowed to have a certain level of functionality that is above the normal condition we have now. And so they will be communicating not only on the, the five sensory methodologies that we use here and a bit of intuition, they'll be using another, let's say, five or six intuitive channels or energetic channels above and beyond what we're using. So they would be looking for communication in a subconscious sense from others around them that they're not getting. And so they would be start to be having aggressive tendencies because they get frustrated, they can't get that, the, the, the feedback back from the people around them. Usually, the, it's usually the, the parents that can't give them the feedback because they're a different level of entity. Okay. But they are able to access higher functionality significantly higher functionality in terms of their creativity, their connectedness with source and the multiverse. And so they can pull things in. They can come in fully operational in terms of being a piano player, for instance, or a mathematician, or, a, or a, 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 you know, any other function that we consider to be um, out, of, you know, out of the normal regime of understanding without levels of significant levels of training or teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Do the two passive ones continue to learn? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 The whole yeah. The whole point of being passive is that you're. Imagine you're in the back seat of your car. Mm -hmm. You're able to look at the scenery, aren't you, around you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just don't have control. Of it. Just don't. Just you just don't have control of the car. That's <laughs> okay. it. It's the same thing. They still. <laughs> they they they're, they're 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 experiencing learning and evolving in a passive way rather than an active way. Okay. And that's what happens there. Yeah. Um, would is there a possibility of soul integration? In other words, the two souls in the back seat may be integrating either into the primary or to each other. No, okay. no, they're always separate. They're always separate. Yeah. Well, well, that's a good question. I want to come back to that in a moment. Okay. All right, because that's called reintegration. Okay. But not at the level you're thinking. At this level. Okay, okay, yeah, that, yeah, right, okay, okay, so I'll come to that in a moment. Okay. Now, we can also incarnate this way, where the soul is split between two bodies. Twins. Or triplets, if you have. Yeah. And so you have the twin flame. That's not a twin. That's not a twin flame. That's not a twin. That's that's a, that's a, that's a, 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 a soul soulmate. That's a sympathetic soul. That's a twin flame because it's using the same soul in two different, two or more different bodies. That's the twin flame. You see how we're starting to realise that the the terminology that we use is completely. Yeah. Incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. So twin flames would exist only when the soul is divided, and only then in an entity stage or a sub-entity stage. Yeah. Like yeah, that. that could be here. I mean, you could get that yeah. in the same way as well, for instance. Yeah. 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 Now I had an instance of a lady, it was a Chinese lady, who I was giving a reading to, and I found out that what she'd done is before her her true a primary aspect had done is it had projected a shard out into an incarnate state before it incarnated itself to enable it to do a function on earth and then pass that function on to it before later. Yes. 
Yeah. Leave it to the Chinese. Yeah. And I, think it's, I don't think it's just the Chinese that have done this. I think we all do it. It's just the fact that I've just happened to have spotted it in that particular environment. Okay. It makes me think of wondering why the Mozart, yeah. um, maybe the shark had gone out before to get that information before yeah. we yeah. came in. Yeah. 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 It may well be that this particular part went out and spent a whole life learning how to play the piano and then fed that into that particular part and that one incarnated fully operational. We're seeing more and more of that in some of these. We are seeing more and more of that. Yeah, yeah, of course. There's more, there's more to it though. Sometimes this bit, and I want to talk about this later, but how we incarnate, is actually got a bigger bandwidth, a bigger pipe. So the communication between there and there is greatly enhanced. And not, to, and not to the point not not to the point of shall I say uselessness. Yeah. So maybe that like Einstein we would say had a bigger bandwidth. May well, yeah. Yeah. Or Tesla. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Uh, before you leave the human form, I have a question about the human form uh -huh. that you've drawn. Yeah. I, I, I could ask it now, or you, you want to go on with some of that? Well, ask, ask it now. Okay. Uh, how did, who decided, you know, like we hear that this human form has the five aspects as you've drawn it there too. Was, uh, it had the terminology, the Adam, Eve, Cadman body, or the Adam, Cadman body, oh. which was a prototype. Did that, was that designed Maybe by a group of TES, yes. and not just one TES, Correct. Yes. but a group, group of them. maybe they took instructions from like the Creator God. Oh no, there was no, there was no instructions, it was go and do it. Oh. If, you, if, you, if you want to incarnate, if you want to experience the lowest frequencies in the way that they are supposed to be experienced, rather than, rather than experiencing them from an energetic condition, you want to experience them in, in the, the lowest frequential condition, the solid condition, then it was up to a group of these to go away and so, so create a body. Us TESs that designed all of this. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. And the other and and the other vehicles that are out there. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the other vehicles that are out there. Not just the human vehicle, the other incarnate vehicles that are that are out there. Oh yeah, well there's a whole universe full of different form factors, yes. Yeah. Now then when these come back into here, okay, after there's a, a whole group of analysis that happens when it becomes disincarnated to understand whether the incarnation was useful, what was accrued, what was missed, what was gained, what was um, beyond expected performance, what was below expected performance, how it interacted with other aspects that may be guides or helpers or other shards that could be helpers, those sorts of things. After it does all of that, it, it may decide, elect, to go back into and reintegrate with the Trinitic Self. So the true self will have all of the sentience, the sub-individualized sentience that creates the aspect reintegrated with it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's time to get fearful that you're going to lose your mind when, you, when your physical body dies. What it means is that the the personality that's in that, that will have been developed over a number of different incarnations, a lot of different incarnations, becomes specialised. And therefore it retains that specialisation within the true energetic self. Now how does that work? When it gets reintegrated, all the energies that are there, that are part of that sentience, gets integrated into this sentience and sets of energies and gets distributed around. But it's still got, you still maintain that personality within this greater personality. So you have something called a group of souls within the, the true energetic self, for instance. So then you see, then you can, so there's all these groups of souls are within multiple personalities, multiple experiences that are within a body of energy and a larger sentient unit. They all collectively create the bigger soul, the overall soul. The oversoul, what I call the trinity self, but individually they can also function as well. Think of it, think of it like how your computer works. 
In your computer works, you store a program on your computer like, let's say, Word or Excel or PowerPoint or some other function, some browser or other. You download it off a disk or from the internet and it gets put on the disk. The files don't all go there. It goes anywhere. Right? Distributed. Where there's space, a chunk, one of the files that makes up the total program gets put in there. It's the same, as an example, for the aspect that reintegrates. All of the experiences and the sentience and the evolutionary content associated with that gets distributed. But they're all in link with each other because they've all got the individual, shall I say, energetic and sentient personality associated within that, in there. And they're all linked to each other. There's a tremendous level of sharing there. Like a, like, a, like a synapse in a brain, for instance. They're all linked together. Okay? And when the true self wants to reuse that particular level of specialism, it pulls them back out and creates the aspect in individuality. It's not quite individual because it's still linked. <laughs> so, it's still, so it's separate but together. How does it do that? Pretty much the same way as our computer programs do. When you push your launch button, a little program squirrels away and gathers all of the different files right, that, have got, that are part of that program because it knows where they are because it looks for the addresses and says, oh, what, that one's over there, that one's over there, that one's over there, that one's over there and it puts them into a piece of RAM, random access memory, temporary, which creates, in our instance, it, this would create our aspect. And so we have individuality for a moment, or should I say, temporary individuality for the length of time of an, of an incarnation and the before and after conditions. And that's the one that has all the mathematics skills and that one's born into a body. For instance, that, yeah. That for instance, yeah. For instance, yeah. Is the healer or yeah. is the for instance. counselor. Or like take the great masters who have come to the earth, like Jesus or yeah. Buddha or Muhammad, others. In a sense, that's how they were pulled out. In a diff <coughs> that's, that's one way, but there's another way. In this instance, this particular example, the true energetic self, or the oversoul, the Godhead, the higher self, whichever way you want to call it, takes a known aspect out of, re out of integration and back into separation, or temporary separation, as we, we know, because we never, we never totally separated, and recreates it there. Or, it could create another one. Because basically, over a, a period of time, it will create 12 known personalities. And each of those might create 12 known personalities there with the shards. Okay. It may decide that none of these have got the correct skill set it needs to create an incarnation. So it can do this. It can put three souls together, four souls together in one body or more. Or, it can create a hybrid soul or hybrid aspect by taking chunks from that one, 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 and creating a thirteenth or more versions, okay, which are hybrids of these. So it'll be a hybrid soul that's got the aspects, or should I say, the experience and the evolutionary content of the of the of the aspects that it needs to be able to perform this particular life. Okay, I'll put a square, I'll put a, put a triangle there because actually this, this would be a temporary condition. This wouldn't exist afterwards in isolation. This wouldn't be retained as such, although it would. <laughs> yeah, because all, the, all of the information that's experienced in that particular incarnation with that particular hybrid soul or aspect will be redistributed back into these things later. When they're, and also when they're integrated into there as well. So technically, in a sense, um, the true energetic soul or self could pick out pieces of its learning out of its computer program, yeah, so yeah, to yeah, speak, yeah. and make it into an aspect for a specific I said, yeah, that's right, yeah. event yeah. of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. One, one that it wouldn't retain. Yes, okay, that's good. 
any personality that's created there is then separated back out into these things which may then either be there already working somewhere else or would, be, would have been experiencing communion or reintegration with, with the higher self. Mm -hmm. And it's the personality that's really hard. It's the, it's the, well, the personality is the word I'm using to say it's the total experience and learning and evolutionary content okay. that that particular soul accrues in a particular incarnation or series of incarnations or series of other experiences that may not include incarnation. Yes. Okay. Is this getting too complicated? <laughs> <laughs> Mm. And see, uh, energy. Yeah, could, it could be. It could be that one of those is a is a hybrid condition that allows that functionality you just talked about: clear audience, clear, you know, clear voice, clear sentience, um, total creativity, instant ability to do things upon birth. It could be that that's that's that's, that's what's been created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about ascended masters, didn't we? Yes. An ascended master as I've just been given it, is basically a TS that might project just one down. And that bandwidth might be significant. So you only tend to get one aspect in the incarnation from a true energetic self or Godhead that's classified this as an ascended master. Because they would have a significant amount of bandwidth there. Okay. So that's, that's what happens there. Now there's another instance of this where although you have a shard created there, individualized units, that actually there could be a sub-incarnation. So although, the, although these are, they're also incarnations, they're shards, they're, they're, they're individualized incarnations, there could be something called a sub-incarnation. I'm making a mess of this, aren't I? Let's, There's a Bible code hidden in these dots. <laughs> let's, just, let's, let's look at it from this direction. Let's look at this true energetic self. And it's got a bunch of different aspects that's incarnated. Let's say this one is incarnated in a physical body in a higher frequency environment within the physical universe. Okay? And let's say it's in the ninth frequency. This individual, okay, would have a higher level of functionality than we do here. Because we're predominantly in the first three. Well the gross physical is anyway. So our our consciousness, our sentience, exists and rotates around the first three, even though the, the form is created from ten frequency levels. We tend to associate with this bit. In this case, because it's the ninth level, it's like having more bandwidth, okay? Because they've got, they're a higher frequency level, they've got more functionality. They'll be able to communicate in some level with their true self, they'll be able to get information from the rest of this, the, the multiverse and source they would have a lot more understanding of what's going on than we do here. There'd be no question about knowing their heritage. There'd be no question about, is there a God? There'd be no question about who was the creator. There'd be no question about the longevity of the physical form. There'd be no concern about the longevity of the physical form. This, in, this, this individual may well want to experience a lower form of incarnation whilst also experiencing that. So it can do it in two ways. It can create the shard, which we know, individualized, or it can leave, elect to leave its primary incarnation right, and experience a secondary incarnation.
So that vehicle there, physical vehicle, then goes in stasis. And is monitored and is okay, is okay. So the aspect is then inside here, in this body here, enjoying, well not as the case may be, an incarnation on earth, for instance. Now the information that's experienced by this particular aspect in this earthly incarnation is being fed back up to the primary incarnation and ultimately the true energetic self. And in these conditions, because of the level of frequency that the primary incarnation is in, its peer groups might also want to experience some information about what this particular entity is experiencing down here. And sometimes this vehicle is removed from its environment and monitored. Like we take an animal out of the jungle, we sedate it slightly, we take blood samples, we take DNA samples, and then we tag the poor animal. With a, with a GPS locator or something. The primary incarnation here may decide to do a similar thing with that, to see how the function of his body is, how long he's got to live, what diseases are in there, what it's, what it's experiencing. And so that's where how abductions come along, so-called alien abductions come along, because they're taking the, the body that's part of a, a secondary incarnation, checking it out, giving it a service maybe, yeah? and then putting it back in again. And then when that physical vehicle demises, the aspect goes back into the primary incarnate vehicle and continues that particular life. And then when that life finishes, it goes back into the, the true energy itself. Once you travel on the frequencies, can you call on these that are You can ask, you could, you could yeah. I mean, you've, and if you wanted to stick around in the lower frequencies, of the multiverse, those between sort of, from, from our perspective, above three and no higher than 12, you could ask to communicate with some of these things. Mm -hmm. One of you might be one of these. <laughs> okay. This is quite a common occurrence. It's allowing a, sub a second incarnation, a sub incarnation to take place within the lifetime of this particular incarnation. So the shard bit happens a lot as well. And Dolores Cannon's actually picked up on some of these without understanding what she's got. She knows that the person she's talking to on Earth. Or her own shards? Yeah, is a shard. Doesn't recognise it as a shard, but is in communication with its, another part of itself elsewhere within the physical universe. So all, this, all of this is showing us that. What we are can incarnate in many different ways. Also, it can elect, if you wanted to, to, to share. So it could share itself, almost like a twin flame, with another, another body for a period of time. So then again, you get, in this instance, not specifically within the twin birthing condition, where the twins are let's say the soul is split between the two, at birth, you get the opportunity for the soul to do the twinning outside of birth. So you still get the twin flame bit, but that may have been born 10 years before that one. So you get the twin flames that happen outside of the, of the biological twinning condition. So much flexibility. Yeah. There's all sorts of things going on, we don't know. Now, there would be an advantage for the primary that's in stasis to send an aspect yeah. below. It may want to avoid some of the, the negative aspects of density and therefore will send part of itself. Yeah. Would it do it for that reason? Or why would it do that? To enhance its understanding. Think of it in terms of... maximizing its incarnate opportunity whilst individualized. Yeah. In fact, making the shards is, in, is maximizing its incarnate it's opportunity. A smart thing to do, yeah, yeah. It's a way of paralleling up the experience yeah. whilst, indivi whilst individualized outside of the event space condition, outside of the little localized universes that we create when we have a choice to make. 
go this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way, and how they fracturally, <coughs> fracturally branch out. Now you happen to do in your illustration showing a broader bandwidth to that as to that aspect. Yeah. Would it take a broader bandwidth to that aspect in order to do the sub? What down there? You mean that, you mean have about have, have, yeah, yeah, have that down there? Little broader bandwidth it's difficult because it's already it's already in a, in a reduced condition here, but that reduced condition is nowhere near as reduced as that is there in a primary incarnation on Earth. So you've still got this this limited condition there with this incarnation on Earth, but between there and there, this is only available because this is in a higher st higher frequential state. It's a different thing to the ascended master type when it's a it's got an ability to create the bigger bandwidth. This is a, na a naturally larger bandwidth because it's a higher frequency level. Right. Now I have a question about the uh, true energetic selves. Okay. okay. Is there a level where the true energetic selves all cooperate for something bigger? Like we could talk about all of this having to do with planet Earth. But is there something that organizes that even at a higher level? They could group together if they wanted to in a collective function and create a, a super TES if you wanted to. Yes. You know, created of, you know, you know yeah. created of, yeah. Yes. So you got the, the S, T, E. Yes, yeah. yeah. You could do that, but we don't. Because actually a super, super TS is the, is the source. Yeah, because we are functions of the source. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then we have what we call, you hear the phrase galactic council. What would be a galactic? Would it be one true energetic self? Then it would just be one true energetic self. The Galactic Council is bringing it down to the human level again. Oh. Galactic Council is something to do with incarnate aspects, not in a human form, another incarnate body, but not specifically on Earth. It could be anywhere else within any of the frequencies associated with the physical universe. So that's, that again is at the aspect level. I see, and they voluntarily gravitate toward forming a council. Yeah, a bit like we do. Still remain aspects yeah. of their TES. Yes, a bit like we are now. Do you want to call this a council? You can do. That's yeah. what they do. There's, there's, they're, they're all aspects of a different... They're all aspects of different true energetic selves grouping together to create well, a function within the, within well, the physical what universe. What that to happen? In other words, yeah, look what's been going on. A, a, a need to create harmony. Yes, of course. Yeah. That's, that's and this would be a choice too. Yeah. 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 To yeah. Except that note that what we call galactic individuals, and in this instance, you have to think of galactics as not specifically being only from our galaxy, but from being in all of the galaxies within the physical universe. That's well beyond Arcturus and Pleiades and all those sort of different places. Well out, parsecs, countless trillions of billions of par parsecs away from our current galactic condition. Countless galaxies away from where we are right now. There could be individuals who are different aspects. Because of our limited sense of what we, how we perceive things, yeah. we use this as... We, we always try and bring it in our own back garden. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We always try and bring it in our own back garden. Yeah. yeah. So we can yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's difficult for mankind to think above itself. That's right. And so, isn't it? So, it's, so, it, puts it, so, it, so it puts so it puts human labels on things and, and puts them on a pedestal. Yeah. This is why they have trouble communicating with us, trying to get their yeah. knowledge down to the level of yeah. understanding yeah, but that we've got. Yeah, but their level of knowledge is not much, not much more than us. Oh, really? Yeah, it depends upon where they are, which level of frequency they incarnate into. This individual here would have a, a, a higher level of natural knowledge than this one here that was in the fifth frequency within the physical universe. 
because of the natural bandwidth that occurs and actually the closeness to the true energetic self. In a sense then this is an exquisite um, sentient library for a source and for origin. Yeah, every time, every time any of these or any of these experiences, learns and evolves, so does that. And so does the source, and so does the origin, all at the same time. Okay, so the word is that sound is changing. In other words, that aha moment, I was thinking it came from our true entity self, and it came down and helped expand, but if we're pushing it back up to it, so where does it then come from? When we get aha moments, it's because we have a momentary ability to access that higher frequency information because we're thinking in the right way, or not thinking is more the word. Okay. Oh, yes. Allowing it to come in. Allowing it to come in. The moment we start thinking, we lose it. And we lose it so fast. We lose it very quickly. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what we just did the past few days, so you can walk down that super little highway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Now then. I'm going to talk about how we incarnate now and then go on to the walking bit. Okay. <laughs> if we imagine our true energetic self here and it projects energy down. Right. I've got to make a bigger matchstick man now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I apologise for my appalling Actually, artwork. Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. The energies come down and they go through, not specifically the crown chakra, but through what the Hindus call the mouth of God, the medulla oblongata. So the Hara line goes through and comes down and splits out. Okay? So our energies come down here and the Hara line is like a tunnel, like a tube. And it allows our energetic and sentient essence to come down it, down through the frequencies Okay, down through the frequencies in a protected way. So our Hara line is almost our bandwidth, if you want to call it that. How do you spell that? Hara. Hara. Okay. And it comes down this tube, this Hara line, into us, and comes down to around here. To a place called the Tantien. Tantien, and then gets distributed out via what we call the core star, because that's how it looks. This is this is this is Barbara Brennan te uh, terminology. This is by the way, via the core star, and it looks like a star because that's where, if you look look at it this way on, then she comes down, hits the Tantien, gets distributed out, and it spreads out into the energy systems associated with the, the chakras and the mini, the mini chakras. Is associated with one particular chakra or more? No, none of the chakras. None of them? No, it's none separate. of them. Separate. It's, just, it's, a, it's, a place where, it's a place where energy gets distributed. And the, and the, and the, the core star, in my understanding, is, is the product of the distributing of the energies. It's a bit like getting um, a bunch of fiber optics and wishing them around, you get the light flicking all over the place, it's a bit like that. So it looks like a core, it looks like a star. This is, the, this is where the, the energy is associated with the, the, the aspects. Bottom out, yeah, a bit like the bottom of a, of a thermometer. And then it leaks out and gets distributed. And this is, this is called the core star, because they're so close together. It's unbelievable. They're really close together. And they start to progress and move around and 
become part of everything that's there in the various different energy centres that are there, including the where the, the plexuses are, where, the, where the, um, the, major, the major chakras are, and the minor chakras and the mini chakras. Now, the essence of self sits just behind the heart chakra. Yeah? Soul seat. The soul seat, the essence of self, the identification of self. The identification of self or the ego, which, which identifies with the human form. And that's where we get the little personality, little transient personality, called the ego coming into it. What each of us is using right now. <laughs> okay? Yeah, the Chinese explains this very well with their chi, which is life force. Yeah, well, the chi is sort of this. Yes. Or ki. Which is the same thing, but in Japanese. Yes. Yeah. And, and it can also explain something else called prana, which is external. Yes. Okay. And they call it the dantian as opposed to the tantian. It's just. And, yeah. And they they uh, describe it as the the hub, which is the distribution That's it. directly below uh, and 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 south of the belly button. Hmm. That's right, because it's actually very close to the sacral chakra. Yes, it is. Where sacral chakra is about three inches below, the tantien is about one and a half inches below and one and a half inches in. Yes. And then you've got the, the core star, which is closer towards the centre, actually, where you get the plexuses with the, with the chakras. Join together. And there's other connections to where the spine is as well. Yeah, so you've got all of that happening. Okay. How does the hara relate to the kundalini? It's the kundalini effect is the passage of energy, or should we say the conscious movement of energy up and down this level? So you just said the kundalini effect. Effect. So yeah, that says it all. Yeah. So then it's the hara that is not, the kundalini is not a separate energy. No, it's it part of, effect. it's an effect, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the raising of energy back up the body, or down the body. And you know Kriya Yoga, when you're, when you're doing your Kriyas, you're bringing energy up from the coccyx, up the susuma, the small yes. pipe, and then through the front of the body, and then back down again. That's pretty much the same effect. When you can feel the energy is doing that, and I can do it without even breathing, you get the you feel the energy rush up and rush down, and sometimes that effect is so profound, it's intoxicating, mm -hmm. and that's what people seek: this kundalini, this this intoxicating effect of the energy rush up and down the, the spine, or the hara line. The kundalini is it, it's like a, it's a, it's a rising snake, isn't it? They call it rising snake. Actually, Kundalini is an interesting piece of artwork because we use it for the medical profession, don't we? Mm -hmm. The two snakes. Mm -hmm. Was it the olive branch or something or some branch or something? Yeah, that's the same thing. So this is how we come down and we distribute, how we incarnate. When the physical body demises, everything gets withdrawn back again and has to go back the same way. Now, depending upon your consciousness so to speak it depends upon how you experience this it can be a complete blank or you can experience the tunnel effect or you can experience the expansion condition what happens is all the energies withdraw back back towards the, the, the core star coming back go back towards the tantin and then go back up the hara line and then find their way back towards the true energetic self but in doing this if the consciousness is still there you get this experience of going through this tunnel because your consciousness is actually following the energies going up the Hara line, which is this energy tunnel which protects the energies from the effects of the lower frequencies. When you come out of the seventh level, when you'll start to move away from the spiritual physical aspect of our human form, the bit that's the melting pot between the purely energetic and the gross physical, you start to experience expansion. So you can experience all of a sudden you may experience vast net levels of knowingness and your visual condition is 360 degrees what we get in Samadhi for instance. 
Hindus call it samadhi, transcendental meditation, removement, removal of the soul, or the consciousness from the f constraints of the physical body. <clears throat> so you, you can get this feeling, and you can get the expansive feeling, depending upon how your consciousness is. And as you get closer towards the areas where this bit isn't required anymore, because you go into frequencies that can support the Trinity itself, above the 14th level, then you can ex then you get this experience of light because you're moving into a completely light condition in comparison to where we are down here. Okay. So that's how we incarnate and get back out again. Now in terms of walk-ins, that happens almost like this condition here where a soul can move out into another, into another body within a different time frame. But that's more likely to be in the condition where you've got a single body and other souls in there. Now what happens with a walk-in is that there's an agreement within the true self or between true selves that the primary or single aspect that's incarnated in a body has maybe achieved what it needed to achieve and therefore that body is either going to demise or the opportunities he continuously uses maybe the car's only five years on the used car on the used car sales room and it can be used again for another ten years by somebody else yeah. maybe that true self decides to let's say that's an aspect and that's the body it's in withdraw that and put another aspect in there or it can be from another true self and so the walk-in can come and swap over so one soul comes in the other soul goes out it tends to be agreement at the, uh, the trinity self level there's various versions of this <laughs> okay Let's call this the human body. We can have a soul going out and a soul coming in. That's a one-to-one -one replacement. Okay? We can have a soul coming in and the original soul staying. So it's a two-to-one relationship. And they can, this can be like halfway through the life or any point during the life. Or it can be more. It can be three to one, four to one, etc. Depending upon what's required. And they can stay there for the length, length of the life. Or they can elect to go in and then come out afterwards. So they can elect to come in, share a body in a two to one condition for four, five, six, seven, eight years. May even become the dominance or the primary source, soul of that body and then they can choose to come out after say five six years ten years twenty years and this is where you see somebody change personality mid mid life stream and then maybe they might get it back later you can also get this condition where one soul comes in and one soul goes out and then this new soul that's coming might go out as well and another soul coming in yeah <laughs> so yeah, it can happen within minutes, hours, time. Yeah, minutes, hours, days, years. Does it usually happen when a person is asleep, for instance? No. It can be instant. It can, it can be right now. It's you. You can spot it when there's significant personality changes happening in front of your eyes, and it's not specifically a, a function of, you know, the schizophrenic condition. It's a completely different one, that can, and you won't see it again. It might be there for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it, it, might, it might go. A good example of this was one of my students uh, in Bangalore went to the Valley of the, the Pyramids. Um, it's about a day's ride outside of Bangalore. And there was a guy there, a young guru, who was giving a, um, a two-day seminar on meditation and other things. And he said that before this seminar, he had had the fortune 
of having the aspect that is Babaji, an ascended master, do a temporary walk-in into his body. Because these are temporary walk-ins. Temporarily came into his body. His personality or his soul became passive. The Babaji soul became the active or the primary soul. Took over for two weeks. He didn't lose any of the learning that was going on. Right? And then it disappeared. And he found out a lot of information. And one of those pieces of information which is interesting, as he said, the frequencies are now, using my terminology, so high that you no longer need to do some of the things that you needed to do in the past to, to bring your frequencies up. And he specifically quoted Kriya Yoga. Now, Babaji introduced Kriya Yoga back in the 1800s, didn't he? Through yes. Lahir Mahasha. Yeah. And he's now saying you no longer need it. That doesn't mean we need to stop it overnight, but you can still do it if you want to. But he's saying that all you need to do now is meditate. Oh, and become a vegetarian, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, so it's, it's interesting that an ascended master temporarily walks into a body, gives us an update on where we are, and then nips out again. Yeah. But it is activating what is called the prana. Well, the prana and the outcome. The life force, Apparently, yeah. there is an aspect of the heart that's positive and an aspect that's negative. Prana and outcome? Yes, that's because it links in with the anu. Because there's left hand and right hand anu. Positive and negative yes. anu. Well, these are all in the spine. And what humanity needed was a way to quicken spiritual evolution. Because there is a natural aspect to spiritual evolution by just going around the sun in one year and having the influence of the various constellations. All 12 in one year will bring you one year of spiritual evolution, but it's called solar evolution. Yeah. But it takes a million of those to make you illuminate. And not only that, that whole year you have to be happy and healthy. Yeah. <laughs> So it takes a million years. Yeah, yeah. So they wanted to speed that up. And so it was Lord Krishna as Babaji who brought yeah. to humanity a method of doing it in 30 seconds instead of one year. Yeah. And that was, and he called it, and it was disguised, he called it offering the inhaling breath into the exhaling breath. Mm. You disjoin the course of breathing. Yeah. And that was to develop a conscious awareness of the heart. That's and right. to lift that consciously in, out through the... That's and right. Yeah. So that was a very... You, it, it probably took several lifetimes of preparation to be able to mm. use that technique effectively, but there were many dedicated souls oh, yes. in the physical yeah. who followed this path and this technique was reawakened yeah. in 1850 and you have to, there has to be a total dedication yeah. to become breathless, to offer the two breaths and disjoin and yeah. the, the course of breathing. It really took a sincere total dedication of your total life. Mm -hmm. 30, 30 or 40 years plus. 30 or 40 years. And so yeah. forth. Yeah. So that you could reach, achieve, it took perfect balance yeah. of body, mind, emotions, mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. And you did that through a balanced lifestyle yeah. that cooperated with this technique. And that is what Guy is telling us now is not required. I know, but you because said this, I remember you and I had talked and said that you had realized that that. Well, yes, I, well, I didn't realize it because of the frequencies. What I realized was. When you do achieve this, you achieve a perfect stillness. That's right. And when I got to the perfect stillness, <laughs> and I also had other reasons, I discontinued the technique, but I felt okay about that yes. because I had some degree, now not enough, but some degree to keep going. Yeah. And then now these higher energies have yeah. completed. And, 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 also, and also, even when they were necessary, they would only get you to a certain point. Yes. And then the rest of it was sheer That's right. dedication, and devotion. Even in during Yogananda's 
this time, his key disciples could only go to a certain point with that technique. That's right. That's yeah. absolutely yeah. right. Though. So it's so it, it, it had its limitations, but also, but it got you there. It yes. got you. It got In you there. In other words, you might be almost there, but if you did the technique, you'd go over. Yeah. Yeah. The Yogananda spent a whole week with someone he met in India in 1935 that was so close, but the guy wouldn't accept Kriya Yoga because he had his own teacher and he felt yeah. I have to be loyal. Yeah. And Yogananda stayed with this guy a whole week and finally persuaded him to do Kriya, which took him into this ecstasy yeah. that you talked yeah. about, yeah. Yeah. about the heart. So, yeah. And you're saying that that's not necessary now. No, no, thankfully, it's, apparently... It's, it's not, it's not, it's, but Babaji's saying it's no longer necessary. Yeah. But you can think, but think about it. If you look at the... If you look over the last 200 years, if, if, and if you've seen some of the information that's there, it took yogis a lifetime of dedication to be able to separate themselves from their body, the association with the body, and be able to experience the greater reality in the way they were supposed, they were supposed to then. And they did, they did that. That was difficult, that took a long time, 40, 50 years. Then Babaji introduced Kriya and it shaved off a lot of time. I think um, uh, Rajasi Janakananda took about five years, didn't he? Which was, which was unbelievably quick in those days. Yes, it was. So he got to that state in five years using Kriya Yoga. And he had also practiced it many lifetimes Previously, before. yeah. yeah he's, he, was, he was coming in with a level of pre prior knowledge. So, in Yogananda's terminology, this is the aeroplane method of getting to this level of condition. Now we're experiencing a, a faster condition than that, so we can do it in a weekend or, or, or more, or certainly within a year, if, depending upon your dedication. And that's what I've been teaching, and it's also what Babaji is now teaching. You just need to do to get straight into meditation and do it. So you can see that. The, the techniques that were being taught at the time were relative to the level of frequency, the base yes. level of frequency, the level of ascension, yeah. the level of ascension on the earth. Yes. If we're farther up, we get access to higher function, we don't need to do the things down here. Think of it this way, technology's moved on, we can do all of our complicated logarithmic functions and calculus in a single press of a button on certain computer programs. In the old days, we used to have to ferret through logarithm books and do ext ext extrapolation to bridge the gap between the middle of the tables and all sorts of things. It, just, it took days to do calculations. Now it takes nanoseconds because we've got a higher level of understanding. It's this ex experiential curve that starts to happen. The more we've got, the more we can achieve. The more we can achieve, the more we get, the more we've got, the more we can achieve. And eventually it goes, the growth is like that. And we're starting to go on this, this start of this curve where the Exp experiential curve starts to kick upwards and so things that are happening quite starting to happen quite fast now mm -hmm. and at some point it'll happen really really quickly like we'll see things happening within days not decades we are already we're already starting to see things happen within years the years within decades so it's going to happen quite quickly and of course at some point things will happen within seconds or nan nanoseconds okay Now, some of these progressive states are being experienced by us, and we can, we can observe these things in terms of who's being incarnated. And Cynthia mentioned some of these Asperger's syndrome children or whatever that are coming in with higher skill sets, you know, already able to play the piano at two years of age, you know, in virtuoso standard. And one of the things I've noticed completely independently is there's a not only one new type of child coming in we talk about these indigo children the rainbow children the crystal children who ba who are basically spiritual labels that we've given to individuals who have certain frequential conditions and abilities to work with different uh, energetic states and have certain levels of knowingness whilst here and that now there's a completely new generation coming in something I've been told to call the hybrid children where they have a little chunk of rainbow, a little chunk of, well, say most of the chunk of rainbow, most of the chunk of crystal, and most of the chunk of indigo children. They have all the best attributes of all those, those children together. And that gives them the opportunity to be more 
efficient in the way they operate here. Those other children worked best in locations where the frequencies work in harmony with their own frequencies. You take them out of those levels and they struggled. All of them did. And this is, this is a well-known fact that they were, they were struggling, they, they went into psychosis or they committed suicide or all of these different things that went on. These new children, they can cope with most of the locations on the earth, most of the local frequential states on the earth. And so they can move around and still be in harmony. And they can ascend and still be in harmony. And all of the newer kids now, the young children now, a lot of them are being born in this hybrid state where they've got all of the attributes of these other, other kids all married together. I'm seeing this more and more and more. When some, of, when some of my reading clients ask about their children, they're either a hybrid of all three, or if they're older, they're a hybrid of two of those conditions. And there's lots of them being born. And they will inevitably help, either passively or actively, raise the base frequency of the, of the Earth to levels we can't even dream about, actually. They're going to do that quite quickly. Maybe within our time frame, our, our incarnate time frame, possibly just outside of it. But they're certainly going to be assisting the base level frequency to ascend. So the human form will be moving up the frequencies and getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So our motor car will start to use new technologies like aluminium sh chassis and plastic technologies rather than cast iron. <laughs> you know? like the Tesla. Yeah. Tesla. yeah. Tesla. Think of it in terms of how your motor car has been evolving and the technologies. Heavy metal technology like cast iron this and cast iron that and thick thick metal for your door skins and your, and your, and your fenders and your, your, uh, uh, your trunk lids and your what we call bonnets in the UK, yeah? the hood. Yeah? Think about 30 or 40 years ago, there were thick, thick technology. Now it's thin technology and it's, it's hybrid technology. That's the way the human body's going. And fortunately for us, some of our bodies are keeping up. We get, we get little bits of changes that we can, note, that we can attribute to being coming back in harmony with the frequential states. We get joint ache, we get muscle ache, flu-like symptoms, we, loop, we, we struggle with energy. We are waking up after a fitful sleep of eight or nine hours, shattered, totally exhausted. That's because we're doing other work as well, more, more, more semi-conscious work. And our human form is, keep, is keeping up with us. In the workshops I do, you, I'll teach you first to get physical feedback from going at the first seven levels. And you can feel that. And some of us now are starting to feel tingling all the time or, or different states of awareness all the time. Our, level, our levels of intuition are, are growing and becoming more accurate. Uh, we get tinnitus at a younger age because we're starting to hear the base resonant frequencies of the chakras. And if you work on those, you can get to hear the, some of the other noises that they make as a result of being in harmony with the, with the energies associated with the physical universe. And so these children are there and they're going to help through localised or individualised or group-wised triangulation, which is ascension through association. They're going to lift the base res resonant frequency of the earth. Some of these kids are going to be passive. Well, lots will be passive actually in terms of what they're doing. They'll be doing it by being in the right place. Others will become leaders, great leaders. Yeah. But also there's another set of children coming on board. And I was absolutely amazed to pick up this information and it made me sit down and look a bit. Because one of the ladies in China I discovered was at an extremely high evolutionary level in her own right. And you could just see it. Her body was perfect. It was amazing. The teeth were perfect. The hair was perfect. The skin was perfect. The skeletal form was perfect. The way she thought was pure, it's amazing. Struggled with the physical world, clearly, but she was a completely different individual to some of the ones I've come in. And when I was working with her and I was surprised to see how high she was from an evolution perspective, she asked about her child. She said, I'm having trouble with my child. And I logged into the child and I thought, whoa, her child was a completely different level of evolution compared to hers, a quantum leap. 
And then I, when, I, when, I, when I dug deeper into it, I was told, I was told to give it the name White Ch she was, It was a white child. A white child. And, that, and, the, and it is one of 12 going to be born over a period of the next 50 years. They're not all being born at the same time. They're being born individually. And they're being born in positions around the earth that are equally spaced to each other. And you said white. White, white, ch white children. W-H-I-T-E. Do you know that the Native Americans have a legend of the white buffalo calf woman mm -hmm. as an incarnation of this kind of purity and perfection and healing, mm -hmm. but, it, but to come like a Christ or the Christ yeah. consciousness mm -hmm. will be fully manifest in this white buffalo calf Yeah, woman. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, that's it's inter it's interesting. Powerful. Yeah, well, this this child, uh, you, you could just pick, you just, when I logged into it, I, th I thought, this is amazing. The information that came from this child, I logged into it, told me that although it wasn't an ascended master, it was the same quality as an ascended master. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Everything stood on end. <laughs> You know, all my hair stood on end. There's not much hair to stand on end, but it was, you know, whoa, amazing, amazing, amazing chunk of energy. And when I explained this, she said, "Ah, oh, I knew there was something funny about him." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you said there will be twelve. Oh, There'll be twelve. There are more, there's twelve of them. There's twelve of them. Okay, and they're all within the same or close location. If, they'll, no, they'll be they'll be equally spaced about oh, the earth. Okay. They, they are going to be autonomous to each other. They will either be passively helping us, a bit like Babaji is passively helping us, he helps in the background, or they will be spiritual leaders who come along and draw crowds and things. So they're either going to be qualitative in their way they help us, or quantitative in the way they help us. Qualitative means that they work in the background and they may have one or two students. Qualitative means they have a, a world following basically or a country based following and they're going to be various mixtures of those. How old are these children at this stage? Well, I've only met one so far. Well not even met not even met that one. I've met them I've met the mother okay. of one. Did she say how old her child was? I think about two. Oh that Yeah. Well, they may live a long time. Oh, well, actually, well, sure they will. Mm. Like in the Bible. But over, yeah, but over the next 50 years, they're all going to become incarnate. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I have a question. How about these kids who are uh, just suddenly turning psychotic, you know, and, and, and taking weapons to school and killing their classmates and, and teachers? They are, they're backfill people. They really are, and that's why they're not adjusting. Yeah. And are they controlled mentally by something else? Something they they, no, well, they can be. Very, they can be. Mm -hmm. They can pick up astral entities very easily. Mm -hmm. Because actually, in most cases, it's their first time they've incarnated. So, so that in, in most times, it, the backfill people are here to backfill, to maintain a critical mass yeah. of individuals here on Earth at the... At the at a, at a lower level of frequency, so that we can continue our can, can continue our ascension, and those who are behind us can also start to ascend. So they're targeting other people that are meant to be taken out. No, they're just basically getting intoxicated with lower frequency existence and thought processes and behaviours. And, and so that what's well, all they're doing is just spinning off. Yeah, that is. Okay. You you can see them that they are they're aggressive. They use poor language. They. Um, get addicted to drugs and alcohol fairly quickly and easily. They get addicted to gang types of existences, those sort of things. They are, they've got individual free will, but they've got no experience of being here. And so they get, in, they get easily attracted to low frequency conditions, very, very easily. Super easily. But they're still evolving, they're still experiencing stuff. And they will, their, their purpose of being here will disappear when everybody else gets up to a certain level. Now. We can talk about ascension after a bit, of, uh, a bit of a break if you want to, about what that means to us in terms of ascension. Oh, that's good talking about ascension. Yeah. Yeah? Do you want me to break? I need to see you. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Do you want to have a quick, quick break? Yeah.
Yes, I think so. Have a quick break. Oh, wow. Thank you. This is like a So the next part of what we're doing really is leading into ascension, this, this ascension process. Now, I've explained before that ascension is a, essentially a gradual and robust process. But there's an awful lot of talk about two earths. You know, we go into a new earth and that sort of stuff. Maybe there's not two Earths, maybe there's 12 Earths. <laughs> we are ascending through the frequencies in a continuous and slow but robust and repeatable process. We're not going through this massive leap that we expected to see back in December 2012. We are basically moving in a gradual process. It's a little bit like us gradually walking up a hill. Okay? We gradually walk up the hill and we gradually get a better perspective of the topography of the area around us, don't we? Yeah? We start to see above the trees, above the buildings, above the, the natural undulations of the, of the ground. We see, we see more and more and more. And then we eventually see beyond the nat natural horizon line. The natural horizon line is 11 miles. But the higher you go, the more you see. Okay? So it's a little bit like that. So the thought process was that we were going to go from one Earth of low frequency condition or low ascension condition to another one of high frequency condition. And there was going to be a an either instantaneous or sporadic movement of individuals from one Earth to that Earth. And that things would change dramatically. Okay? Well, actually, that isn't how it's happening. <laughs> right? As we move up the frequencies, we move up individually, not en masse. We affect each other, though, by you know, this ascension by, uh, as a result of, of association, this triangulation. This triangulation is a function of energetic communication and passive and active education processes that we take advantage of and we work with. So we aren't going to go through this state of evolution that's like massive where we suddenly go from being unaware to being super aware. It doesn't happen. It's unsustainable because this requires a critical mass. Now, clearly we need a critical mass to remain where we are. But if we have a critical mass that goes this way, to continue this way, we have to continue to grow to enable us to maintain this new level. But you only need to have one or two individuals become, should we say, re-attracted to the lower frequency aspect of Earth and we come down again. Because we lose our critical mass, don't we? Think of a balloon. When a balloon's got a critical mass of high frequency air, it rises off the ground. When it loses that critical mass, it descends. Same thing. If we can gradually increase that critical mass and maintain it, the balloon stays off the ground and will continue to rise to a level it can go to based upon the frequencies associated with that hot air. <laughs> okay, and the atmospheric conditions associated with it. What we're doing is we're gradually moving up in a, in a gradual increase that is a, the product of lots of little ups and downs. We can sustain <laughs> we can sustain these little ups and downs. Because, it's because, these, this, because this down here is not as low as that down there. And so we are maintaining a gradual increase. This is a sawtooth progression. Gradually going up with our mean being this gradual progression upwards. So we're constantly moving into this new earth. 
Except it isn't a new earth. It's new earths. <laughs> there are a number of conditions that we achieve where we start to get exposed to different aspects of the earth the higher up the frequencies we get to. So if we're here Oh, nearly, nearly got it right first time. But there's 12 aspects of the Earth. There's 12 layers to the Earth, 12 frequency conditions within the Earth. I'm going to change the thought process now to think in terms of the universe. Because the Earth is a bit difficult to get your head around, because we're here. Because as we ascend, not a lot changes. Or so we think. Because we gradually get used to it. If we think of the Earth as a pan-frequential body, that means an object or something which, which exists across all frequencies associated with the physical universe, then every time we ascend, ascend and we move up a level, and we move into one of these other Earths, we're just moving from one version of it to another version of it, with minimal change between that one and that one. The change different frequency level but the thing is the content what's part of that earth changes and if we gradually get used to it we don't see it it's only when we go from there to there that we see huge change so we're still doing this gradual change right back to the universe if the universe is considered as a sphere And these dots are considered to be the galaxies that are within the universe. And that's it. Then we think that that's the universe. We think the universe is a vast area of blackness with the odd bright bit that's called a galaxy. And in between those galaxies there's voids and spaces that have solar systems. And in between those solar systems there's voids and spaces that house planets. And there's other things like nebulae. But this is consistently equal to the first three frequencies associated with the physical universe. This is all we see because we're only seeing three frequency levels. We don't see the rest of our bodies, do we? Because we're only seeing three frequency levels. The human eye only sees between 400 to 700 nanometers. Nanometers is a function of frequency. But we know there's more below it and there's more above it. Below it we've got the ultraviolet levels of the spectrum. Above it we've got the infrared aspects of the spectrum. Then we've got x-rays, we've got radio waves, and we've got telepathy waves and those sorts of different things, okay? So we know, we know in a limited sense that there is more beyond our sensory capacity that we can experience. And we experience it because we've invented machinery, predominantly based upon our, our own sensory abilities, that can detect a bit beyond. Okay? And we use them for all sorts of things. We use them for picking up television signals, radio signals, mobile communication signals, satellite signals, and for X-ray versions of, of uh, telescopic vision, which is what the Hubble telescope does. Now then, as we're ascending, we are exposing ourselves to more and more detail. So although we know this detail now, as we move up the frequencies, we get that bit of detail as well. So if we go back to our universal state, because it's easy to think of the universe, because it's mostly empty, isn't it? No, it's mostly full, <laughs> right? <laughs> we see, on the fourth level, more galaxies and bodies because we're seeing not only those galaxies and bodies that are on the third level but we're also seeing those galaxies and bodies that are on the third level and the fourth level so using that thought process 
when we move up the frequencies and we ascend into the next earth we'll be seeing what we're seeing here and we'll be seeing what we're seeing in that earth as well your changes in color we start to see entities around us if we're lucky in the corner of our eyes we start to perceive things we're getting a bigger more complete picture okay mankind is a clever beast it tries to invent things for things that don't exist right? time is one of them it looks at the universe and it says we got it wrong we thought it was expanding but it's not it's static we know that now because we've got the technology to prove it but why is it static why is there vast amounts of blackness in between the, the, the bits of brightness what's holding it together so I think ah there must be matter or something there must be something with weight or mass matter has weight or mass um, let's be really inventive and name it after the darkness in between the solar systems and between the, the galaxies let's call it dark matter it's black it's dark we'll call it dark matter it's in between the light bits but as we go further up the frequencies we start to see more of those light bits because then on the fifth level we're seeing what's in the third fourth and the fifth as we go up to the fifth level of the, of the earth which again exists in this pan frequential state it exists in all the frequencies associated with the physical universe we would start to see more so you may start to see trees and buildings that exist on the fourth or the fifth frequency level out there and other beings of a higher frequency those who've ascended before us yeah they'll be existing out there as well those people that you may have not spoken to for 20 years because they've moved on before before us they'll be out there somewhere so the more we go up the frequencies the more of the content associated with our universe we see and so the gaps in the middle the dark matter becomes content becomes universes well becomes galaxies becomes planets and so the information we see in there becomes more and more complete as we move into these different levels what we're seeing around us becomes more and more complete and you start to see things like there's buildings within buildings because they're sharing the same space people walking through each other because they're sharing the same space yeah trees within trees because they're sharing the same space so we don't have gaps anymore when we get to the 12th level okay we have a universe that is totally <laughs> solid or full totally solid or full when we get to this point we will we will see that all of this is solid and full and the same there so we'll see the pole of the earth is completely and utterly totally fully and completely occupied in all ways shapes and forms in all frequency shapes and forms as is this solid ball not this ball has got lots of space in there this solid ball that we call the the, um, the universe so as we ascend up the frequencies we start to see more that's in there we start to see more that's in here as well The other day, last it was at night, 10 o'clock at night, sitting out on the porch, a UFO went by just above tree level mm. and circular, no sound. All the windows on it were lit. Mm. Was that a combination of two frequencies coming together? It may well be that you've seen an entity that exists in this frequency level. Not all of, not all of the entities in the, in the physical universe are higher frequency. They can be the same as us. And sometimes they've got the capability of moving through frequencies to come back to that frequency to, to change direction or change location yeah. so they can move around sometimes they are from a higher frequency and they put a protective field around themselves so they can come down to our frequencies yeah. and still have their functionality their abilities that they that are from their home frequency so to speak yeah. so what you'll so what you'll see probably is, is either that condition they may even come from down here down here or it's 
other entities in the rest of the physical universe that are of the same frequency as us, the same state as us. Now the interesting thing is, can we see these levels? Generally, unless we project our, unless we learn a specific technique and we project our consciousness into these levels, we can't perceive or work with them. We have difficulty. Most individuals can't even do that. Okay, the vast majority of individuals on this planet cannot project their consciousness up anywhere near the first le the level above us. Okay, however, so we can't see what's there, what's there, what's there, what's there, what's there, what's there, right up to the twelfth frequency level. But those individuals there, on the fourth level, can see down. So to them, they've got a bigger picture, a more complete universe than we've got. So they can see what's in their frequency and what's below their frequency. They know what to walk around. <laughs> and not through. And not through. Those in the, those, okay? But these can't see what's in the next level above. But the people in the next level above can see what's in the levels below because they're seeing a bigger picture because they can see the lower frequencies and they can see a much more complete universe and this happens so in the ninth frequency people in the eighth can't see them or can't work with them can't perceive them although they've got this, they're starting to get a better functionality clearly than what we are down here but they can see everything below and this, is what, and this is what's happening. So their version of the universe isn't quite so solid as what their version is. And the, our version of the universe is nowhere near solid compared to what they've got. So our ascension, although gradual, allows us to access various levels of completeness of the planet, or should I say, the universe, the universal environment that exists within. So we don't move into a new earth, we move into different versions of the earth, or should we say, we get exposed to, diff to additional content that is part of the earth, that is part of the universe. Okay. What do they mean when they say middle earth then? Middle earth? Yeah. Oh, isn't that in New Zealand? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> middle earth. There are entities who exist in these levels who aren't specifically limited because of their frequency to living on the surface of the earth. They can work within the body of the earth and work with that because they're a higher frequency that they can work with inside the earth. There's all sorts of things about being a hollow earth and there being a couple of tubes that can go into and all that sort of stuff. Nonsense. They can work with within certain, certain frequential constructs, pockets within the physical aspects of the Earth that are higher frequency, so they're working with this level of Earth down here. But to us it appears that they're inside the Earth. They're not, they're just using a different part of it. Or are they? Or are they just experiencing another part of the Earth which, which is on the surface, which is a higher frequency? The Earth is only hollow frequentially. From a physical perspective, it's still solid. It's got different states of stratospheric conditions, or you know, there's different levels of, of, of layers of dirt that builds up over the centuries, and there's different levels of magna, you know, like hot, hot metals in there. It's still quite a physical being at this level. But as we go up the frequencies, there's more and more that we can see associated with it. There's more and more content that happens on and in and around the body that is the Earth. And it's the same for all of the other planetary systems that are within the galaxy and galaxies that we can see and can't see that are part of the physical universe. I have another question. Oh, Bean's got one first. Oh, How long oh, can we get stuck going up to 12? Can we get stuck in between? How long sort of is our ride up to the different frequencies? From the, from the perspective of this bit being constantly exposed to one of these levels, it's a, it's a matter of how fast the whole Earth can work together and start to work on these levels to, before we start to move up these different conditions. 
from those individuals who are fortunate enough to be able to project their consciousness up these levels, this isn't an issue. You can go anywhere. You can go anywhere much above those, up to the top of the multiverse, because we exist in the multiverse. But from the, the point of view of our, our motor car's ability to go up those levels, it depends upon everybody else's motor cars and how they affect each other and, and pull, pull them all at the frequency. Frequencies. Yeah, good question. Okay, I, I realize that we're occupying the space that somebody else is occupying and somebody else is occupying. I can't figure that out. So don't worry. You don't, you don't need to figure it out. It happens automatically. <laughs> okay, so, so the people that are on the ninth level looking down at the third level and they've got their house in the same place we have our house, what do they perceive? What do they perceive? They would perceive content consi consistent with what's existing on their level compared to here. So, although they can work with this and understand this, they, they will have a different level of physicality. It's a little bit like the interaction of gases in comparison to the interaction of ice. Yeah? The so gas, the, a gas would, in effect, at the right frequency level, permeate an ice wouldn't it? Because it's, it's, a, it's a much finer structure. So we're the ice. We are ice, okay? Mm -hmm. Two frequency levels above us, that's air. The air can permeate the ice because it, it does. It's a, it's a finer structure. The molecules are far, far further apart. But to a gas, it is solid. A gas to a gas is solid. It groups together. Oxygen groups together, helium groups together, yeah? argon groups together. We know that because we can create it. We can separate it out. So if you're up there, although we're a finer condition, actually it's pretty similar to being like this. But with a different level of functionality, a different level of ability, different level of capability. But we, but we still know and we can still work with the stuff that's down here. That, that help. It's, diff it, that, yeah. it's a difficult concept to, to, to achieve, but it's, think of it in terms of having a jigsaw puzzle. Okay? Having a jigsaw puzzle. And then you gradually put the parts in place. You get, start to see the bigger picture of what the, what the jigsaw puzzle is. So the more you and think of it in terms of, on this level, you've only got some parts of the jigsaw puzzle. And as you move up the frequencies, some more parts zone into your visual range. You go, oh, there's some more there. And you put more parts of the jigsaw puzzle down and you start to build the, the, the jigsaw puzzle. And then you go to a higher frequency and oh, all of a sudden, some more parts of the jigsaw puzzle zone into your, your visual range. And you can grab those and put them in the jigsaw puzzle. Another way of thinking of it is, if you have this jigsaw puzzle with you and you have 12 rooms in your house, and each of those rooms represents a different frequential state, a higher level of frequency, going from like the ice to the gaseous states and beyond. In the one room, you've only got three or four parts, so you put those on the, on the, on the board, you're building your jigsaw puzzle. To, go to, to start to build the rest of the jigsaw puzzle, you've got to move into the next room, which represents the next level, the fourth level. And there's a few more parts in there, so you can get those and you can put those in the jigsaw puzzle, and you're starting to get some idea that there's, there's bits missing now, <laughs> a lot of bits. So you go to the next room, which represents the next level, and you find some more jigsaw parts, you put those in there, and then you start to see some jigsaw, some components of the jigsaw puzzle knitting together. Ah, there's a bit of a picture coming here, and you move into the next level, the next room, and you get some more parts. And then you, you move into the next room, and you get some more parts. But you notice that when you move back into the other room, those parts of that jigsaw puzzle disappear. So when you move back into the other rooms you've been into previously, if you were going from the sixth room to the fifth room, you try and bring those jigs that jigsaw puzzle back with you with those parts that you've put in from the sixth room, hmm, they disappear. Because they're not part of the environment that's supported by that fifth frequency level. So you move into the fourth room. And the parts of the jigsaw puzzle that were in the fifth room disappear 
because they're not supported by the, the environment that's there that's part of the fourth frequency range. You move back into the fifth room. Wow! All of a sudden, your fifth room jigsaw puzzle parts come back into vision. There they are again. Back into the sixth room. Ah, here it comes. They come back into vision again. And this is what happens. We move up and down the frequencies. We see more of the content of what's in the bigger environment, the bigger universal environment. And the Earth is part of that bigger universal environment. And because of that, it also has much more content the higher the frequencies we go. So if we went into the 12th room, we'd have a full picture. Move down to the 11th room, there's bits missing. Move back to the 10th room, there's bits missing again. Move back into the 11th room, oh, we've got them back. Yeah? And that's what it is. That's, that's the way to think about it. Excellent piece. Yeah. So that's how we're ascending. We're moving into different rooms, effectively. And as we move into these different rooms, our frequential state rises. As our frequential state rises, we ascend, clearly. And as we ascend, we get access to other content, other parts of the planet that exists, but they exist in a higher frequency. It's a bit like us thinking that we're all ice and we don't know about the, the fact that when the ice is a higher frequency, it goes to water, and when it has another higher frequency, it goes to a gas, air. Okay, I still don't understand how, say you're in the ninth and you're in the same space as somebody in the third, do you just tune them out? Yeah, we don't, we, we don't have the capacity. No, 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 I mean, if you're in the ninth. Going oh, I see. Yeah, the opposite way. I mean, do they tune, tune us out, or how, how do they we, function we, we, on we, top of us? <laughs> doesn't matter. We don't need to understand that. But basically, <laughs> basically, it's like us working now. It's like us working, it's difficult because we're, we're, we're in the wrong place. We need to be in the 12th, basically, to understand this. It's like us working now. But we're moving, but for instance, this table, we could choose to experience it or we could choose not to experience it. And we'd either move through it or we don't. So we, we would experience things in a completely uh, different frequential state. Think of it in terms of molecules. The molecules are densely packed together in ice. The molecules in two frequential states above that, that were the ice, are now rather than being an ice cube, they fill the whole room. Because they're all separated out because they're a higher frequential state. Because they're a higher frequential state, they're further apart from each other. It's still there, the ice is still there. And the ice in its state two levels above is still there. But it's not interested in the ice because it's, think it's interested in its own frequential state. Okay. Now one thing that might help too, there is a state of awareness that goes with each of the frequencies. Yes. And it knows how to handle perfectly. What's down there. Down yeah. there. You, you won't even think about it if you don't want to. Because think of what's going to happen when we have mental telepathy. And we have private thoughts. Yeah. But there is a method that you never invade a private thought. But how do you yeah. know it? Well, you know yeah. It. Yeah. You yeah. But the th you, you had a, an interesting comment. Do we just zone them out? Yes, we can. We can just yeah. tune out. Yeah, well, we ignore it. Again, do we just, just zone them out. Oh, just, just, them. just ignore yeah. it. Yeah. Just ignore it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's okay, that's, that's fine. Now I get. Yeah. Now yeah. I yeah. Get yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, but I mean, think about it. Think about it. How much of this area now are you are you ignoring? Your focus is here now in this room with these people. You're not even thinking about what's in the corner of your bedroom at home, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And because of that, the corner of your bedroom at home, because you're not focusing on it, it's not here with us now. We create everything around ourselves. Collectively, we've created this building. And so have the other people in the areas around us, along with their own buildings. It's all created. That's hard to conceive. It's so, so massive. Yeah. yeah. Actually, actually. If I take it even further, all of us as true energetic selves create or help to create the structure of the multiverse. We're its memory bank. Yeah? On a lower sense, our true energetic selves and our souls, our aspects, help to create the physical environment as well.
one bright young spark who could be classified as Shakespeare or Francis Bacon, depending upon your, your, your angle, said all the world's a stage. It's only an illusion. It's only temporary. It's only there for our entertainment. We are so engrossed in, its, in, it, in it that we totally and utterly are fooled by it. So we create it. When we're a higher function, we can recreate and uncreate. And so we could zone in or zone out to these different locations. We choose to ignore them. When we choose to ignore them, we choose to use them or create them when we choose to create them. So right now, we're all choosing to ignore where we exist. I'm choosing to ignore the fact that I'm several thousand miles from home, from a physical location, and, and therefore it's not, I'm not there. I accept that that part of my existence doesn't exist at the moment. My part of my existence is here right now. My focus is here, not there. It has to do with us creating linear time yeah. and space. That's right. And it's part of the third dimensional property. That's right. So we created that so we accept it as mm. that. When we could also be aware, yeah. but, but that's not part of what we created to be here. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely right. Okay. That was a good explanation. Thank you. Yeah. So that leads us quite nicely into the next little subject. Time for a bit of re education. Well, I hope it sticks. <laughs> Based upon that, we all agree we exist in a frequential state. Are you sure you want to say yes? No. Because all of us here talk in dimensions. We're in a 3D world. We're in a frequential world. Okay? The dimensions are a level of structure well above frequency. If you like, the, the frequencies where we exist are the leaves on a tree. The subdimensional components are the branches that those leaves hang on to. The full dimensions are the trunk. So although we do exist in a dimensional state, it's a much higher level of structure than where we are actually working within. I didn't talk about the first and second frequency, did I? No. I always focused on the third frequency level. Because the third, third frequency level creates the gross physical. Those three together create the gross physical. That's why we've got three chakras that are associated with the gross physical. And then we have other chakras that are associated with the higher frequencies. Those frequencies that we don't see. But if that's the case, then where are these dimensions? I'll come back to that in a moment. Where are we ascending into? Based upon this, the fourth frequency, then the fifth frequency, then the sixth and the seventh. Where does spiritual mankind think we're ascending to? The fifth dimension, and not the fourth dimension. We're going from the third to the fifth. Everything we have is a little waypoint, a little barker point to say, just look at this and see it. If we ascend in a linear fashion, we've got to go up the, fre the frequency. It's, 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 even the, even the Earth-based physics understands that. But what is the fourth dimension? What's the fourth dimension? What is popularly known as the fourth dimension? Because it's, I'll get, it's one word, begins with T. Time. Oh. Right? But time, but all spiritual people will agree time doesn't exist. It's an illusion. So how can we ascend bypass something which doesn't exist? <laughs> there is the answer to your question. Time doesn't exist, so therefore the fourth dimension doesn't exist. So how can we bypass something which doesn't exist? That's an error in our thought process. And that is the evidence that we've got an error. We're bypassing something that we're bypassing something because it doesn't exist. But we still refer to it, we're going from the third to the fifth dimension. We're going past the fourth dimension because it's time. But we keep saying time doesn't exist. How can it exist but not exist? 
How can we bypass it when it doesn't exist? That's the error in the thinking process. That means that what we think of as dimensions is incorrect. What we're actually using is overlaying some higher knowledge that we've taken from somewhere. We know about dimensions, we know about subdimensional components that need to have a certain number of dimensions to create something. And we're putting it into where we are now, in a frequential state. We also know we work with frequencies because we work with it every day. We use them for tele telecommunications. Yeah? Everything we do is based on frequency. My voice is frequency. The lights are frequency. Your telephones use frequency. Your television uses frequency. Yeah? The winds are based on frequency. Everything is based on frequency. So what we exist within is a frequential state and we need the first three frequencies to create the gross physical. After that, things get finer. So when we're ascending, we're not ascending through the, the dimensions per se, but we're ascending through the smaller level of the structure of a dimension, of a dimension per se. So we're moving We're moving up the components within a single dimension. We're ascending within this condition. Now we need these 12 frequencies to create a low frequency environment, don't we? The whole of the physical universe, including these higher frequency levels, are physical. They're low frequency. And they're all contained within a single dimensional condition because it's so low frequency. It needs a whole dimension. When we move beyond this condition to the 13th we move into the second full dimension and the components that make up the second full dimension and because they're finer we don't have 12 frequencies we have the 36 because there's 12 associated with each subdimensional component okay and there's three subdimensional components to a full dimension so if we think about our frequencies being there, they link into something else, which links into something else. And this is the structure of the multiverse. So we move through, we, we ascend through frequencies, we're part of a frequential condition. And these frequential conditions form the basic building blocks that hang on to the framework that are subdimensional components, which are part of the bigger structure which holds it all together which are the four dimensions so we're ascending through frequencies as a physical being as a as a being that is using a physical body to experience the the lower frequencies we're ascending our body not us our physical body our, our true entity self is well above this well above this well above this okay it, but it's projected down to a body which exists in this area okay so we exist actually the physical form exists in 10 frequencies but what we're seeing now is the first three the gross physical the human form uses 10 or works within 10 of the frequencies associated with this universal and earth-based state Of course, there are beings that don't use these, they use these levels. They exist on these levels as well. Or more importantly, maybe they'll do that instead. So they're based, their energy system is based on a higher level of conditions. They may have a set of chakras that are above the ninth frequency above the seventh frequency. But it's a completely different energy system to ours, because ours is gross physical, and theirs would be totally spiritual physical and energetic. 
So we're mo not moving through 3D, not going from the 3D life. This isn't 3D, this is free frequential. <laughs> yeah. we've, what, we've, what mankind has done is it's taken something and put it in there. We've substituted something. We've got not misinformation, but misunderstanding of information. It's a bit like this date business about we're going to ascend on the 21st of the 12th, 2012. A lot of individuals put their, their careers on the line with that, and a lot of them lost their spiritual careers as a result of it, because they misunderstood the information. They misunderstood that actually at this point in time, we're going to be at this level, and we're going to go that way. But actually, we've gone that way. And actually, this point was over here somewhere. <laughs> we got there earlier. So we, we, mis we misinterpret information. And we misinterpret information because the individuals who give it to us don't have the depth of function to be able to get the information. How do we get depth of function? We get depth of function by existing, by ascending and working with these higher frequencies whilst here. So our base frequency, rather than staying around there, maybe it goes around there instead. So our lowest frequency is three, or our lowest frequency is four. Depth of information. How many of you can see the information on the sign that's on the road on top of that mountain over there? Right? On top of the mountain. Yeah. There's a road, there's a, there's a road on that mountain with a sign and there's, there's, there's writing on it. There's road ends here. <laughs> Very good. None of us can, of course. None of us can. Why just there? But if. Yeah, yeah. It says Beena's house. Yeah. Please. Watch yeah, Beena's house. Yeah. <laughs> but, but if we got closer to it, or we had a different set of glasses or a set of binoculars, we could get closer to it. So we start to see it as an outline rather than the detail. Mm -hmm. So if we got a better set of binoculars or a telescope, we could get a bit further to it and we start to see a bit more. If we then had something that was significantly bigger, like a Hubble, like a Hubble. You can see right up close to it, and you see the imperfections in the typeface on the yeah. sign. Yeah? And you get something like an electron microscope attached to it, and you go right into it. That's where we are right now. We can't really see what's out there, because we don't have the capacity. We're not at that level. But when we are at that level, we get the tools to do it. We get a new pair of glasses or a new pair of binoculars that are with us all the time. And that's why I know that we are within a different level than we think we are. Because the information we're getting is based upon, I can't see it. Can you see it? What did you say it was? Oh, OK. End of the road. Yeah. Maybe, it's, maybe you invented it. Oh, maybe. Maybe, you think, maybe. maybe you're appearing to be smarter than me because you've given something and no, nobody else can answer it. Let's, let's use what you've just said. Yeah, so when we eventually, so when we eventually get there, we find it actually <laughs> says something completely different. Yeah. Yeah? Stop now. Yeah. <laughs> so we, so so we we base it upon what people tell us, and we believe them because we put them on a pedestal. They've got they they've got something we can't see. We can't prove they can't see it. So we work with it mm -hmm. until we can get there ourselves, and we start to, or we might progress a bit further than them. This is going to the next subject, by the way. We start to see that there's a difference, there's an incorrection. It's incomplete. The information isn't right. And so it's only when we start to get the ability ourselves or rise to those frequencies that the data we're seeing starts to become clearer. And the previous assumption is then recognized as being wrong. And that's what happens when we get this information with individuals who are using knowledge and putting their own scent on it to try and make it work. We get their scent on the information, with their desires on the information, their requirements to be put on the pedestal and sell things like books and films and slides and do world tours and stuff. That's a materialistic thing to do, to, to do isn't it? <laughs> Doing lectures. For <laughs> cash. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going on Oprah Winfrey's show. Yeah. <laughs> So, the, what, so it's all about the depth, of it, the depth of field of what we're picking up based upon our frequential state. 
So as we start to rise to the frequency as a result of our own ascension process, we'll start to see clear, more and more clearly, and therefore the error states will start to get more and more reduced. And as a result, we'll start to understand how we are moving up and how we are ascending, and we'll start to realise the environment that we're existing within. And as with the universe being mostly empty, we'll recognise it's mostly full. <laughs> okay. So this tells us about something about our, our leaders, doesn't it? Our spiritual leaders. In general, and this still happens in India, by the way, a lot, the leaders, even though they'll say otherwise, they not need to have individuals around them to back up their own levels of possible awareness. And so they try and teach their students to experience what they're experiencing, just like I am. Okay? But at times, there becomes a situation where the guru, the teacher, okay, the sensei, or the sifu, or the senpai, depending on which planet you're on, <laughs> or part of the planet you're on, yeah, needs to have the backup of the students on a regular basis to keep them in the position that they're in. And so they say, you need to link him in all the time. In the old days, this was necessary. You could only get to a certain level of, of, of awareness if you linked in and worked with the, with the, with the guru, the teacher. Because the, the guru or the teacher did something for you. They created the space for you to work with. They created a higher frequency environment so that you had a leg up. A frequential leg up. Okay? One of those frequential leg ups, specifically in India, was to remove a part of your karma. And in doing that, you are elevated. The guru knows the rules surrounding karma and can dissipate that karma from you. He knows how to do it. He's not attracted to it. And so the, 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 uh, the chila, the, the student, gets a better perspective on existence and starts in, has a, a higher point to start from. And they can progress faster and farther. But at some point, that student needs to become more than the teacher. But in general, that doesn't happen. The teacher type likes to hang on to the students. We all like to hang on to the students. We don't want to let them go because they feed us, they clothe us, they help towards the, the ashrams, the, the, um, the clinics, the, uh, the halls that we create, the holistic healing places, okay? the places to go and learn from, the universities we create. We depend upon them, or the teachers depend upon them. And so that limits the, 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 the students. They believe they can only go up to a certain level, a certain level of the teacher. And the teacher keeps them there because there's a dependence, a physical dependence upon the, the students. This, unfortunately, in the old days of Hinduism, and now, and even now, continues into the death the physical demise of the teacher's form. You can only get to where you'll get if you're linking in with the guru. And your link with the guru continues past the demise of the physical, which it can and does, but it's still a limitation. So in real terms, unless there's a special student involved, the student is linked in to the capabilities of the teacher. And so a teacher should if they are true and honest, get the students to the point where the student is actually better than them and allow them to grow beyond. So that the next set of students can grow beyond their students. And so what should happen is the, the, the teacher should remove the dependency from themselves. When they've got the, the capacity to fly on their own, like birds, birds are kicked out the, the nest, aren't they? Fly, you know, poof, out you go. And they either fly or they hit the ground hard. Yes. They learn to fly pretty quickly, don't they? You know, within that, within that 10 or 20 feet, they've learned to fly. You know, it's quick. It's that, that, that transition is that fast. It's the same. It's the same between the teacher and the student. You have to give your student the capacity, the ability to become your master. And it's a good teacher. It's a good master that is enabled to get their students not only to be equal with them, but to be better than them. That's progression. That's where we're supposed to be. Not supposed to be creating dependency, 
We're not supposed to be creating, making our students dependent on, dependent on us. We're supposed to get them to a certain point and let them progress further. So that when they get to the stage of their students are coming up to equal them, they can push them further and they can go further as well. And so the master creates the student and the student becomes the master of the master. And if, this, and if the teacher is a wise enough teacher and they have the capacity, they will then become the student of their students. They will become the students of the new master. And this is real progress. This is real progress. Removing the dependency, but allowing the, the leapfrogging effect to happen so we can move up faster. And if we remove the, if we can allow our, our students, if we can teach them properly to move beyond us and better us and progressing and allowing this state of frequential ascension to continue upwards rather than, rather than plateauing out or in some places going down, we can assure the gradual and robust and in some cases accelerated ascension process that we will experience whilst incarnate. And in doing that, we will, we will undoubtedly remove, as we can do by removing karma, the need to incarnate while we're here. So don't depend on your, on your teacher all of the time. Your teacher should be telling you to go and fly on your own. They should be able to pinpoint out and say, okay, you are capable of becoming a teacher in your own right. What else are you, are you learning? What else are you getting that I'm not getting? What levels are you achieving that I'm not achieving? Teach others that. And I'll learn off you as well. And that's the, that's a, that's a re, that is a, a really good teacher who can do that. It's to allow the students to progress further than them and then learn from the students. And so as the students progress, everybody else, if they've got the right thought process, pushes the other students above them and then follows. So that even the teacher who may have been there, who created a student that was there, who created a student that was there, who created a student that was there, can fast follow as well. And so everybody moves up at the same time. But it needs the teacher or the, the teacher to give the students the individuality and the ability to move beyond them by removing that dependency. Once they've got to that level where they can progress in their own right. And that's the end of that lecture. <laughs> okay. I think it's a good time for lunch, for those who want to eat lunch. And if you want to have questions and answers, we can do that afterwards. One of the things I noticed um, during the work I was doing with the, the Origin Speaks was that there was a, a progression that's happening within the different source entities that is consistent with some of the Hindu Vedas. And it took a bit of time for me to correlate the two together. But in essence, the thing that kicked it off was being told that we're in the third, we're in the third evolutionary cycle. And so I went back and thought, what does this mean? So when I asked the origin about it, he said, yes. You're in the third evolutionary cycle. So I asked it to explain to me what the third evolutionary cycle was. And he said, well, basically, and this, this diagram isn't, isn't to, uh, to scale, by the way, because if you, the source entities would be infinitesimally small in, compas in comparison to its area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness, mm -hmm. that part of itself that it knows about but hasn't quite mapped out. The area beyond that it knows about, a bit like we know there's things out in the universe, but we haven't got evidence to suggest it's there, but it knows us that it's there. And he said that really what's going on is that the source entities have been located within my area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness, and they've worked with the localised energies in those areas. So they've expanded their, their sentience within these areas, in the first instance, using that body of energy that they've been given, and they've created their own multiversal structure, or not as the case may be, and populated it with their own smaller versions of, of themselves, or not as the case may be, to experience and investigate and map out the energies that are associated 
with the particular parts of the origins area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness that they were located in, in the first cycle. So they did that. And all the entities, including us, let's use our source entities as the primary example here. Our source entity created a multiversal environment within these en energies in, in, this, in the area that, that was existing within and populated it with us. And we went and we, we, we experienced, learned and evolved and we worked our way up the multiversal structure that was there then. When we all went through that total evolutionary cycle, working our way up the frequencies or whatever was there, I think it's the same actually, that, and we all get to the top frequency, all of our true energetic selves get to the top frequency, we all recommune with our source. And when that happened, the source said, okay, I've mapped out this location. We fully understand how to work with this small area of the origins area of polyomniscient self-awareness. It's mapped out, it's understood, equivocally understood. And that level of evolutionary content and status is copied and passed across to the origin. It no longer needs to be there, it's mapped out, it's understood. So that, ent that sentience constricts and contracts to a small part and then commandeers a new body of energy within another location within this area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness and created the second evolutionary cycle where another structure was created and the energies that were there that were still based upon frequency and subdimensional components and dimension etc were investigated and worked with and existed within and evolved within and again we evolved from our source sensitive perspective we evolved through the structure of the multiversal environment that's there and when we all got through it all we recommuned with our source and it gave up that area of energies that was within the, the area of the polyomniscient sentient self-awareness of the origin and constricted back into pure sentience again and then moved over to another area and inflated itself again and created a new environment, commandeered new energies, created another multiversal structure to, ex to exist within and populated it with, with us again. So we, um, what we are now is we're, we're within the first I'm just being told 10%-ish of this third cycle. Oh, wow. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've, we've, but we're, we're moving really quickly in comparison. Because when I see some of this, the, some of the incarnate entities and their evolutionary cycle, there, shall I say, in some instances, 60% or more above, or through the, through the structure, of that multiversal environment. So we're moving quickly. So it looks like, although we've only en just entered into this cycle, we're moving faster and faster. Our ability to work through the evolutionary cycles is increasing. So we if we took, for instance, let's say a thousand years to go through that cycle, it clearly didn't. It took countless billions of trillions of years in the man mankind's understanding of time to go through that then it looks like it may have taken 700 years rather than 1,000 years to get to that. And it looks like this might take less time to go through that. And then when this one's finished and we all work our way up through the, the multiversal structure and finish our cycle of evolution and we recommune with source, the sentience will move out of that area and constricts back into a small blob of sentience and then, re then commandeer more energies here and go through the fourth cycle which may be a faster cycle than the third cycle. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing here is the expansion and contraction. The expansion of the sentience into an area of energy, occupying the energy, expansion out. In the Hindu texts, the breathing out of the universe, mm -hmm. of the multiverse. When the job's done, he breathes in and contracts back into this little dot of sentience. And then he breathes out again 
as it finds this new area of energies and expands out into it, it commandeers those energies and expands back out again into it, it breathes out. And then when it's done its work, it breathes back in again. Removing its sentience and all the other set individualized units of sentience is created. Moving away from that area of commandeered energy and moving back into a new one, expanding back out again. So there we've got the breathing in and the breathing out of the universe which is in our case the multiverse and it's the expansion of the sentience into a body of energy initially a given body of energy and then the contraction back into pure sentience changing the location of that sentience and expanding it back into a, a newly commandeered body of energy that's the second the transition from the first cycle to the second cycle and the third cycle is the contraction of the sentience back out of that commandeer body of energy, the relocating, relocation of that sentience and the commandeering of new energies and the expansion back out again of the sentience into that energy. And then when we finish this cycle we'll do the same thing again. And so this is the link between the information I've been picking up and the, the Vedas basically. Time we, as a sentient group, do this, we've already carried the knowledge that we've had before yes. and apply it in the new, so consequently it takes us time. That's right, yes. Now, eventually, when all of this, and this again, this isn't a scale, when all of this area is fully mapped out, okay, when it's all mapped out, yeah, yeah, when all of the area of the current area of polyomniscient sentient self-awareness of the origin is mapped out we then all move into the next area this area is not even a tenth of one percent of the of what the origin thinks it's it, it, it is it's this area here this area here just this area here increases by a by a factor of 12. So we've got this thing where we go from frequencies, subdimensional components, and then dimensions, and from there onwards, the next state, which is zones, is a, the power of 12. And in each zone, everything that was in the previous level is all contracted into it. So everything is increased by the power of 12. So there's 12, 12 levels of structure in here. And everything is 12 times 3 times 12 times 12 times 12 times 12 times 12 times 12 to the power of 12, which is the full structure of that. So when that's investigated totally, then we move out into the next bit, which will be another function of Is this 12. just our source entity, or is it all oh, the source entity? Oh, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the origin, oh, and, all the so and all of the source all entities, the source all of the source entities, entities yeah. doing it in their own way. Yes. This is how our source entity is doing it. Yes, so but, they're, but they're all expanding and contracting into it in the, in the way they are. And, and are they doing it like simultaneously? Well, who knows? That's up to the origin. Uh, <laughs> well, well, it may be it may be that source entity four, for instance, finishes this cycle and comes down to here into the fourth evolutionary cycle before source before source entity one does, for instance. You know, and so that that may come later. And so the fourth source entity says, yeah. hey, look at this. And then six, six might come later. Yeah. You know, and seven might come <laughs> before <laughs> one. That's what I was saying. <laughs> do, what fun. <laughs> do we retain our individuality yes. through one, two, and three and yes. onwards? Yes, Isn't yes, that yeah. Yeah. yes. More importantly, more importantly, more importantly, because we are growing as a, as a, as a result of our experience, our learning, and subsequent evolution. When source and individualized units of source of the different source entities, which includes us, and the origin, because everything is the origin clearly, moves out into there, we become source entities in our own right. Oh, wow. Our true energetic selves become source entities in their own right. And the reason for that is because this new area here although it might only be sort of there in comparison, actually so infinitesimally large mm -hmm. 
does it need to have a whole it new a whole group of source entities, entities <laughs> to even stand a chance of mapping it out? Exactly. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. And that's and that's well, it. That's so there. Yeah, next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, in, in, relatively speaking, in event space, it's probably next week. Yeah. <laughs> but it, no, this this is this is a long way away. This is this is a long, long way away. A long way away. Yeah. So this is it. So this is it. We we are when this is all mapped out, we move into the next area, and this small dot, this represents a small dot, and it might end up being a little bit more. That's all. <laughs> But it's a factor of 12 times 12 times 12 times 12. So it'd be a factor of 12 to the power of 12 bigger than this is. You know, yeah. it's amazing how you related this back to the Hindu scriptures. So much of what you said this morning relates directly also yeah. to the ancient Kabbalah and the tree of life, as they call it. Yeah. It's all the same thing. It's not new news. No, no, no. It's no. new old news. Yeah. It's not new news. Right from the beginning. Yeah. yeah, but we forget. And sometimes cultural differences mean that we can't possibly understand it. Yeah. So it needs to have a new set of clothes sometimes to be able to work. And actually, in some instances, I've noticed that the information I've been getting is actually a, a bit beyond the scriptures, which is what you'd oh, expect, course. isn't it? Yes, of course. What you'd expect. Yes, definitely. And then somebody else will pick up something in a couple of hundred years' time, or, or perhaps, or I hope earlier, yeah. you know, that will, that, will, that will progress it further. You know, so it'll go beyond my, and I'd like to think that in my lifetime, somebody else will take the information I'm getting and go further. Of course. Well, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, as you yeah. have said. Yeah. Not any of us would be where we are today yeah. without somebody lifting us. Up. And that's it, yeah. And uh, I was talking with Joshua one time, saying, uh, one of the Ascended Masters, and he said, it's that way all the way up. Yeah. They all are mm -hmm. being helped from higher up. Yeah. To, yeah. To us just we all stand on each other's shoulders, yeah. Yeah. and gladly so. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. and gladly so. And they have said, even those like the Galactics who are more advanced, where they are saying, "Look, we're helping ourselves when we come back to help yeah. you, yeah. because we're doing that because that promotes us too." Exactly so. <laughs> it allows, because the some of the Galactics, if you want to call them that, are higher frequency, they can't move with the whole f physical universe into the next frequency level, the 13th, which is finer, unless everybody else is there at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we are the linchpin right now because the key to that is that everybody gets individualized free will because the galactics don't have it. They don't have individualized free will. They have various versions of will, collective and various different versions of collective will. They don't have what we've got here. They don't have it. They don't have it. None of them do. So we are very precious. This is a big experiment. When this succeeds, when when the Earth, when we all as in, when when our incarnate bodies are of a level of finitude, that when we incarnate into them, they're twelve frequency bodies, and everybody can do that, then everybody else in the rest of the physical universe will be allowed to have individual free will. Because actually, most of them are above our level right now anyway so they'll be able to catch up very very quickly yes. wow. it's just like a critical mass mm. yeah. except it to be a sustainable critical mass yes that's that, that can't go back it be, yes. because it's been it it's already be, it's already been down there yeah it, it's already gone up and gone down and it's, it's learned how to not it's learning how to not go down yeah, so, yeah. Wow. There we go. and that's it thank you oh my gosh thank you if you want questions and answers, we can move in. If you have, if you all have time. I don't know. I don't think. Or did you have enough? Did you, did you, I think people asked their questions during midstream, didn't they? Oh, we never let you rest. We kept pumping you. So, if anybody wants to have a specific questions and answers session, we can do. But uh, oh, yeah. if you felt that. Yeah. Okay. I don't think so. I don't. I feel so full. Yeah. It's like, it's just, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. We'll leave it at that then, shall we?